All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to our senior design conference presentations. Um, so this is the performance session for mechanical engineering. So if you're not in the right spot, here's your chance to find the right spot. Um, you can see kind of behind me the, the schedule for today. I guess it's over my, my left shoulder, my left, your right. Um, this is gonna be the order. So we have six presentations today. Each of them will be about 30 minutes total. So each will be about 20 minutes and then we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answer. Um, I'll get a little bit to that in a second. Um, my job here today is just to keep everybody on task. So teams, as you present, I'm gonna give you about a two minute warning before you hit that 20 minute mark, um, just to let you know where you are. Um, and then if you get to 20 minutes, I'll give you a little bit of grace if you're wrapping up. If not, I'll cut in and um, let us move on to questions. Um, panel members, um, advisory board members, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your, your input um, and your feedback that you give these students. Um, they've worked real hard all year. Most of you are not too far removed from that process. So know that, um, you know, they've, they've come to a big head of um, achievement here. Um, so um, once the question answer period starts, um, y'all are free to unmute yourselves and ask questions to the, to the students. Um, but everyone else that's, that has come, so the other, other students, friends, family, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask them, but I prefer that you use the chat feature. So if you've never used Zoom before, um, at the bottom of your page, there is a button that says chat. If you click on that, um, a chat will come up on the right. You can type into there. I'll kind of keep an eye on that. Um, and during the question answer section, I'll voice those. All right. Um, other than that, we've got about a couple minutes before we're going to start. Uh, we are going to try to keep right on pace for people who are going to be jumping in and out um, just to see their, you know, grandma coming in just to see their grandsons or granddaughter's presentation. Um, we'll keep on schedule for that. Um, if there are any quick questions, though, about how we're going to run things, we do have about a minute and a half before we're going to get started. All right, so our first team is gonna be um, the automated sandbagger team. Um, they'll come in and introduce themselves, but um, I see Sahil, um, all of y'all, y'all can unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves and then whoever's sharing their screen, um, you should be able to do that now. Hey everybody, I'm Zach Schecksnyder, Robert Blue. Saw to saw. And I'm Brett Bazron. And we will be presenting to you today our automated sandbagging system. So quick overview of what will be covered in this presentation today. We're going to give a little bit of information about our sponsor, um, go over the purpose for doing this project and what we are hoping to accomplish. Uh, we'll go over the system that we designed, all the main and key components of it and what the purpose of each component is. We'll show, show a diagram of our final assembly with everything fitting together and we'll ask for any questions. First up is our sponsor, um, Hayes Manufacturing. They're located in Pondville, Louisiana. Uh, they are a large scale manufacturing facility. Um, 
they have over 150,000 square feet worth of shop that they have to work in all the latest technology and robotics and welding and it, anything you need to produce, you could get it done there. So they've been really helpful in the process of getting this project done. Uh, more specifically, we've been in contact with Cliff Hayes, who's their vice president. Uh, the purpose of our project is to create a device, a system that could be backed up to any pile of sand and start bagging sand in a quick and efficient way in the instance of a disaster heading our way. Um, we want to be able to bag as many sand sandbags as possible in a short amount of time and reduce the labor required to get it done. So this is our overall system. As you can see, like Red said, it's all mounted on a trailer so you can access any remote sand pile. So the basic idea of our project is you can back this trailer up near a pile of sand, turn on the linear actuators and allow the case to move into the sand pile. So once sand starts falling into the inlet hole, which is labeled sand in, there's an auger inside the case that will move sand to our loading system, which is on the right, and where two operators can sit there with bags and, you know, bag the sand. So <clears throat> our auger is nine feet, 10 inches long, it has a six inch diameter and is made of carbon steel. It, um, the reason, like I said before, we're using it is so it can transport sand from the pile to our loading system. We have a cone on the end, which is used to pierce through compact sand. And like you saw in the previous picture, the, the auger is at a 20 degree angle. And this angle is specified by um, screw conveyor companies, which they say is the best angle for sand to flow properly. So we had to purchase linear actuators to help push the case into the pile. The ones we purchased had to move at the same rate, so we made sure to buy some that had Hall effect sensors installed in them. They extract 40 inches and transmit 400 pounds of force. They can also, it's easy for the operator to use because they can be operated by a wireless remote. Um, another something we had to do was we needed to install a power converter so it could be used at 12 volt and 30 amps. Here you can see our motor <laughs> box and the chain coupling that attaches our, <clears throat> the chain coupling that attaches our gearbox to our auto shaft. The two horsepower motor turns at 1750 RPMs, which is reduced by the gearbox to about 39 RPMs. And this is an acceptable uh, rotational speed for the auger to transmit the sand from the sand pile to the bags themselves. <clears throat> Here you can see the frame that we had custom fabricated by Hayes Manufacturing. We designed this frame in SolidWorks specifically for our system. It holds the auger and it is also where the linear actuators are mounted from. The, <clears throat> the frame underwent stress analysis in SolidWorks to ensure that it wouldn't fail whenever we we're using this in operation. This is a concrete vibrator that we attached to the side of our auger system. This allowed the auger to push through the pile without uh, meeting too much resistance. The vibration from this actually made the difference between the auger penetrating the sand and not penetrating the sand at all. So without this, we tested it in the winter quarter and it didn't work at all. But then after we made this addition to the project, the auger was able to fully penetrate into the pile and it also helped the sand flow into the inlet hole of the auger case a lot better. So here we can see our loading system that we designed. So this thing, uh, this is the last addition we made onto our system, but previously we made this out of HVAC ductwork and uh, it's really thin material, did not work at all. 
And at, you can see on the picture on the right, we have a vibrator, the orange vibrator attached to the loading chute because the sand would not flow through the duct work we had before. And uh, this was fabricated by Rusty Welch and Shudrant. He did a great job and it worked very, very well. So now that you've gotten an idea of all the different components, here's another view of the system. If you follow me from left to right, you see the vibrator attached to the cone, you see the cone, and you see the blue label where sand goes in. The sand goes in and comes out where the blue label says sand out. Here's just a quick overview of our budget. Uh, just going to go down the list on the major items. You can see we spent $800 on the trailer. We got this from Facebook Market. Ended up saving a lot of money there. Uh, our auger system was manufactured by KWS Manufacturing. We got that for $4,200. Uh, our linear actuators ended up costing us $845. The frame was $300. That's not including labor because we had this manufactured at Hayes Manufacturing. Uh, travel back and forth to Pineville, Louisiana, $140. The motor was 353. Uh, our loading system and the vibrator mount, which was fabricated by Rusty Welsh and Shudrant, was $900. Generator, $500, and a couple other things. A lot of other miscellaneous things that we needed. Um, and that left us with $1,200. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome. Um, so I think uh, my, my first question was going to be, what kind of research did you do before you started designing this? Um, I know there's seed augers for people who work on farms and, and stuff like that, and I've seen conveyor systems. So this seems pretty novel for uh, you know sand use, but and I, I've never seen it used in sand. Um, but what kind of research did you do before you designed this? So we researched in the beginning, our three main ideas were this auger, um, a conveyor where you shovel sand onto and a digging conveyor. Um, <clears throat> the thing with the digging conveyors were that they weren't really ideal to use at this angle. And whenever we contacted screw conveyor companies, they told us like, this is what you need. It wouldn't flow as well as you'd want it to, but in order for it to come overcome the 20 degree difference, and to overcome the friction horsepower that's required, you'd have to use something like this. Also to add on to that, we, uh, we were also worried about the abrasion problem we'd have with the sand against the auger case and the auger, because that's the main reason why sand is not used in augers. Um, and we found that we found that we would need, if in the final product, this is a proof of concept, in the final product we'd need to coat the auger and the inside of the case in a special compound. I have a couple more questions, but I'll let someone else from the council ask. Yep. Um, I know we jumped quickly to kind of like, you know, your final design. Was there any, and we talked a little bit about like the research, but was there any alternate designs where they, you know, slight modifications or just completely different concepts? Uh, we had several completely different concepts. Uh, one of them was, like Sahil was saying, uh, a digging conveyor, which would be like a conveyor belt with uh, small extrusions off the side of it to where it would be backed up into the pile. And as it would come around, it would just grab scoops of sand. And that was actually the original idea from our uh, sponsor. He told us that he would like a digging conveyor belt system. But uh, after looking around for a something that light that was like that that we could possibly make we ran into a lot of issues with uh actually being able to source a digging conveyor system so we decided to start brainstorming and we came up with this also the digging conveyor would need to be incrementally backed up into the sand pile as it ran out of material to grab so this 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 design eliminated all that by pushing directly to the middle of the sand pile and just feeding we also uh, initially thought that we would have a hopper with a large bin just sitting in the back of the trailer that the uh, auger would dump into. And when we started putting it all together and realizing the 
heights that we were working with, um, we knew this wouldn't be be possible. So we figured out a new way to implement a loading chute onto it. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll add this. Not, most designs or auger systems or feed systems have a hopper. So this is pretty cool that you don't need a hopper. Um, you mentioned that you uh, those linear actuators can apply about 400 pounds of force, but you couldn't get it into sand with that amount of force and you needed that vibrator? <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, each linear actuator produces 400 pounds of force. So we have a total of 800 pounds being pushed into the pile. But whenever we tried to go out there without the concrete vibrator on there, it got about to the, the flange right behind the cone, the flange that attaches the cone to the actual pipe that is the case of the auger. And it, and it just wouldn't push anymore. And the actual linear actuators started beeping and going into a safety mode where they were being maxed out, I guess you could say. And so we talked to our, uh, our material, uh, one of the specialists at the college that uh, specializes in civil engineering and foundations and things like that. And we told him what we were trying to do. And he t suggested the concrete vibrator. And that really <clears throat> did the, made the difference. Because once we turned that thing on, our system just moved directly into the pile without, without ever slowing down. Did you do any back calculations on how much force you were coming up against with that friction and such? I'm kind of thinking we have a lot of hurricanes and floods, you know, in the areas that we live in. A lot of times these piles of sand that you have in a certain location may have been there from the year before. So you might have wet, settled sand um, that could be fairly difficult for you to push that auger through, even with that vibrator. So like, have you done any calculations on like the surface area, that cone and the friction and the force required to overcome it? Yeah. Um... We, we asked that professor about that sort of idea, like how much force would we need so we know for sure. And he said it's very dependent on the materials properties, like you were saying, if it's wet, how wet, how saturated it is. And then after, also it gets pretty complicated because it depends on the height of the pile. And the, the higher the pile, obviously the more compact the sand in the middle will be. So once we started to try and dig into those calculations, we realized that it was a little bit above the uh, the scope of our knowledge for this class. So we, we tried to look into that, but we never got actually got some firm calculations on that. So if it takes, um, or, or, like you said, around 800 pounds of force to actually stab this into the pile, I'm assuming either y'all are leaving it hooked up to the vehicle or did y'all design some kind of locking brake system for the trailer to help hold it in place? We left it uh, all hooked up to the vehicle and we let the weight of the vehicle hold it back. And so uh, was it 20 inches of travel you guys had said uh, that you're trying to stab it into the pile? 40. 40, 40. okay. So y'all are aiming to get it right to the middle of the pile that way you're not having any issues uh, feeding into that suction hopper. Right. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, it was pretty tough geometric. It looks simple geometrically, but it was uh it was kind of tough geometrically to get this solved out to where that cone hits directly in, on the ground. There's a lot of different variables that play into it, like just like how high off the ground the ball hitch is that's attached to the mm -hmm. to the vehicle, or just the angle of the trailer. It, it all plays into it. I have a question. Did y'all take into consideration um, the safety for the operators who would use uh, this equipment? Is there any, you know, special safety yes. features of, of this design? Yes, ma'am. We have, um, as you can see, where the sand in boxes, we attach wire mesh across it to where it's small enough, it's fine enough for someone to not stick their finger through and, you know, get caught or anything like that. Also, we have a door by where the motor is mounted in, just in case, you know, because the shaft is moving right there, we also made a door. So if a bolt becomes loose or someone needs to tighten some things up, they could flip it open and operate on that. What about um, like process efficiencies? Have y'all analyzed, you know, it, it seems like a really good design and a really good improvement for bagging sand. Um, did y'all consider, you know, what kind of process efficiencies this would gain the company? 
Um, one thing that we, unfortunately, it probably wouldn't be used by a company. It would be used by like a, municip a municipality, like a city or something like that. And it would all be on a volunteer basis. So we weren't necessarily uh, looking at how much money it would save them, but really how much effort. Mm -hmm. it, it works out to where if you have two people bagging sand and one with a shovel and one with our system, then you're going to, you're going to be able to bag sand just about as quick for the first five to 10 minutes with a shovel, but you will tire out well before the machine does. So that's where the, uh, the robustness of this machine really comes in. It saves a lot of effort. It's not necessarily a lot faster than a, a fresh set of arms with a shovel, but over the long run, you're going to come out ahead because you can keep working at it all day and not fatigue as quickly. Good. Thank you for the question. Hey guys, um, I really like this project. Uh, I've got two comments. One, don't discount Jenna's question about process uh, costs. If it's municipalities, if they buy something like this, they need to justify it and justify what it costs that volunteer. So if you take $30 an hour and two people operating one of these for a city, um, you know, people could justify buying something like this. You spent $9,000 on it total. Yes, sir. So right um, that's $9,000 that could be used to fix holes in a road or something like that. Um, another thing is I would consider, I know you said you're gonna keep it hooked up to a truck, um, but I don't know how many of you guys fish uh, they have these things called power poles, but maybe a, a change to your design could be some uh, some jacks at the front end that actually stab into the ground or something like that. That way you can pull up in a Subaru Forester with this thing, you know, unhook it, jack it in the ground, and then let it, uh, you know, pull sand. You don't need a big lifted truck. But I like your design. Thank you, guys. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. Thank you. Any other questions for us? Uh, just one last quick one around uh, engineering analysis for it. Uh, I think you guys said y'all designed the support frame in, in SolidWorks. Any kind of FEA or just kind of simple uh, stress calculations y'all performed for this project? Um, so Hill, you go ahead and take that one since you did the so, so, uh, um, for so basically the like we said we had to design the frame and send it to our sponsor mr cliff and we used that model to to simulate the force of the linear actuators against where they were attached to and based off of that we knew the force they were they had on them and then we had a factor safety of around 25 for the frame and the lowest would be right at the joint that it's at but it was like very minimal um another little calculation we did um where the gearbox is mounted in the back of the system it is it's sitting on a, a steel plate and that steel plate very slightly deflects while it's operating and so we took a measurement of how much it was deflecting, found the resultant force that would be put on that plate by that deflection, and did a stress analysis um, around the weld where that plate was uh, fabricated. And both our hand calculations and the solid work simulation were pretty close to each other. Very close, actually. Excellent, great job. Well, thank you guys for your time. If there's uh, no more further questions. Thank you all very much. All right. Thanks, guys. That was great. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule. It's about 1.50 now. Um, and our next presentation's due to start at 2 o'clock. We are going to stay on schedule, so we're not going to get ahead. Um, just in case, like, especially if there's um, a sponsor that's going to call in just for their team. So we are going to wait until two o'clock before we start the next one. So we'll hang out. Um, if you have any more questions for 
automated sandbagger team, you're welcome to type them out in the chat or, um, you know, any other, if the council wants to, to voice any other opinions, they're, they're welcome to. Um, in the meantime, cooling tower filter frame, filter crane, um, I think I've seen all of y'all hanging around in the chat. Um, y'all will be up next, but give it a second before y'all share anything. Hey, Ethan, or Dr. Hilton, sorry. <laughs> What's up, Ben? Yeah, we graduated each other, so I'm like, Ethan, like it. But uh, I guess just for the council to kind of get a, a feel, um, right, because obviously it's much different this year. So we're, we're just wondering kind of like, are there certain um, criteria and like the evaluation form that's probably not going to be caught given, you know, the, uh, the situation? Like, you know, a, a lot of times we usually go for like test results and data and things like that. You know, or is that going to probably be consistently missing throughout the presentation? Um, just trying to basically get a feel for comparative um, between each presentation and what to expect. I mean, the goal was to keep it about as um, consistent from last year as possible. Um, I think the only changes were actually that, and that change wouldn't, wouldn't have even impacted you. Um, the advisors are evaluating teamwork more directly, and that was something for ABET. Um, but yeah, for the most part, um, it'll be as similar as possible to last year. You'll, you'll see that some teams won't have as much data gathered from their um, prototype just because a lot of them didn't have access to it this quarter um, or, you know, didn't have access to where they needed to test it. Um, so for the most part there, you might see more engineering analyses um, like, you know, like the deflection and things like that from Sandbagger. You might see more of that this time around. Um, but, you know, it's one of those, we're trying to, trying to keep it as consistent as possible, but it's, you know, the times that we're living in, so. No worries, just, just more trying to get a feel for kind of what the, the reference points is. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Hilton, would you mind putting the, uh, that Word document you had up at the beginning with all the different team names and stuff? So I'm yeah. working on filling out our forms. Can do. Thank you. Oh, also for the the council. So this is a weird thing every year that for some reason there's you know the scoring is out of ten, but if you look at kind of like how you score the form, it doesn't add up to ten. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. I think we're just going to do like one for need for improvement, acceptable two and good three. Um, assuming we want to do the numbers. So don't worry about the out of 10.
Hey, Dr. Hilton, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen now. That way we have it uh, up and ready to go. If that's uh, if no one has any objections with that. Yeah, Austin, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, you need to stop sharing your screen first. I sure do. All right, there we go. Everyone see that all right? Looks good. All right, Cooling Tower, Screen Gauge team, um, if y'all are ready to go, go for it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Austin Crawford. I'm Ethan DeForge. I'm Blake Sockrider. I'm Jake Stewart. So our project is the Cooling Tower Screen Gantry Filter System. So a quick outline of what we'll be going into. Um, we'll first kind of talk a little bit of information about our sponsor and our design team. Uh, we'll go into our project background uh, and how it relates to our project itself. Then we'll go into the different design alternatives that we considered for our project, uh, which one we ended up choosing, go through an engineering analysis in order to uh, show the structural integrity of our system. And then we'll talk about the prototype we made uh, and the testing we did with it, go into a budget analysis, and then finally discuss the different conclusions or recommendations for production of our system. So our sponsor and design team, we are a mechanical engineering team at Louisiana Tech University. Uh, we rotate uh, roles throughout each quarter. That way each uh, member has a full understanding of each role. So I am the team lead for this quarter. Uh, Blake is our procurement representative and the two designers are Austin and Jacob. Our faculty advisor who's been helping us throughout the whole year is Dr. Hilton. Our sponsor is Quico, uh, specifically their Acadia Power Station located in Eunice, Louisiana. And our contact has been Darian Duncan, who is a plant engineer. So the problem background, uh, so Quico, as I said, their Acadia Power Station is a closed cycle natural gas power plant. Uh, so right now they have some cooling towers with water flowing through it. Uh, in order for their process to work properly, the water flows through into some of their pumps, but before it can go into those pumps, it needs to be filtered because as you can see in the picture, it is open to the outdoor air and it can get different debris, uh, basically from anywhere that could flow through, wind could blow it in, also from other parts of their system. Uh, the main debris that they said they get in there are chunks of fiberglass. If this debris were to get into their pumps, it could damage their pumps, particularly things such as the impeller. impeller. And uh, if that were to happen, it could either reduce the efficiency of their pumps or straight up uh, mess them up, damage them, uh, and this would lose Clico money. So right now the problem is they have to clean their filters once a quarter. And this, their, their current way of doing so is very tedious and cumbersome and it requires two operators. Uh, one of them has to get a crane and the other one has to guide that crane down and hook it up to the filters and then physically pick it up and move it off to the side. And they also have to be careful when moving it since they're using a crane of not hitting the cooling towers. Um, and it's just not the, the safest method currently. So our project is to implement a permanent structure uh, that can be operated by one operator 
uh, via a wireless remote control. Uh, it will be completely electrically powered and it will lift those screens straight up and then laterally off to the side for them to be cleaned. And as you can see in the picture on the right, there is a picture of some of their spare screens that will give you a better idea for the scale of the screens as they are 20 feet tall going down into the water. So some of the engineering specifications we were sure to follow in order uh, for structural integrity of our system. The first one is the Crane Manufacturers Association of America, particularly their specification number 74, which goes into the structural design of uh, the crane itself. We also uh, made sure to follow OSHA safety standards uh, in operating the system. AWS is the American Welding Society, specifically for the couple of welds that we will need in order to connect our high beams together. And then finally, ASTM steel specifications, which goes into the structural integrity, integrity of each steel beam that we have to make sure that it doesn't fail. And now I'll pass it off to Jacob to go over the alternative designs. So our first design uh, it has support beams that are all attached to the existing concrete platform. Um, there's two beams on the far side and uh, the trolley passes through them on the main beam uh, to where they'll be cleaned off to the left. Um, our next design is similar to the first one. Um, all the support beams are still gonna be attached to the concrete platform. Um, the main difference is that there's only one uh, support beam on the far side. Um, it's just going to uh, save space and uh, reduce our costs. Uh, the third design, it moves the support beams all the way to the end of the main beam on both sides. Um, it eliminates the need for an overhang, but it's going to cause us to have to pour concrete into the grass area to attach the support beam on that side. And here's our selection matrix. Um, Criteria we use for cost, clearance, space savings, deflection, and safety. Um, this results in alternatives two and three being very similar um, with alternative three edging it out. And here's our final design. Um, it's a combination of two and three since they were so similar. Um, it has a single support on the, on the far side um, and it moves the, the other support off, off the platform um, onto the other concrete. This just gives us a little extra room so we have all our cabling can bundle up right there uh, so it doesn't interfere with the rest of the system. Uh, next, Austin's going to go over our engineering analysis. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, so the, primarily the engineering analysis uh, composed of structural calculations, um, which I will uh, get to here in a second. Uh, so primarily, we're looking at uh, two loading scenarios that are critical. Um, we're mainly the uh, center loading scenario and an in loading scenario. These would um, impose the highest level of stress through the uh, through that transverse beam that you can see the uh, trolley riding along there. So once we um, spec'd out uh, the trolley that we liked, we were a, we would we had a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, loads that we would be um, having to withstand within our structure. And then uh, we used the um, CMAA, the Crane Manufacturer Association of America specifications in order to, um, in order to spec out uh, a proper sized I-beam for that transverse beam uh, to stay within their regulations for deflection and stress. So I'll kind of get into some of the, uh, the SolidWorks um, simulations that we performed with our final design. Uh, so here you can see a uh, results for deflection for a center loading scenario. Uh, you can see we simulated uh, the four wheels of the trolley with four separate wheel loads that um, added up to equal the total cumulative load. Uh, we also Im imposed a uh, gravity onto the system um, and we used a fixed geometry uh, constraint on the bottom of the two supports to most closely uh, resemble the actual um, kind of the boundary conditions that we would be experiencing. Um, within our this simulation, we see a maximum deflection of about uh, 0.29 inches. The uh, CMAA specs call out a maximum deflection of 1 600th of the span of the, of the beam, of the transverse beam, which in this case would, would uh, be about an inch. So we're well within that. And then as far as our analytical calculations, um, we calculated it to be 0.237 inches. Um, which is 
within the ballpark, it's a little bit off, and that's mainly due to the fact that the joints themselves um, are not totally rigid. As you can see, there's some deflection at, um, at both of the joints, which would um, increase the total deflection of, at the center of the beam. Um, so then we also did some uh, stress uh, simulations. So here uh, you can see that um, we kind of did the same uh, same general setup with the with the rigid uh, boundary conditions at the bottom of each uh, support. And uh, the the main thing from this slide is just to highlight that um, there is a stress concentration kind of at the uh, web to uh, flange transition on the beam. Uh, in this particular case, um, this is like the highest stress that we saw within the transverse beam for any of our simulations. It's approaching about six to 6.5 KSI. Um, this one, we, we, we benchmarked these calculations with our analytical calculations and they, uh, they were pretty, uh, pretty accurate. This is this particular situation. The one that I highlighted is kind of an anomaly. It, it was a little bit higher than what we um, calculated analytically. And that's probably due to the fact that it's at the end of the beam and there's a sharp discontinuity there that would increase the stress from what you would um, calculate uh, analytically. Uh, so then we did some calculations for the stresses within the welds that we would be uh, that would be to join the, the materials. Um, we, we simulated them geometrically just by uh, basically creating kind of an ideal geometry. It's not a perfect simulation as, you know, welds are never really ideal geometry, but it gave us a pretty good um, understanding of what kind of stresses we would uh, be expecting. And um, they pretty, they're, they're relative, they were fairly close to the uh, calculations that we performed analytically. So we're pretty confident that these uh, results would hold. Um, our prime, the primary, weld that would experience stress is the weld B, which is um, connecting the that overhanging member to the um, transverse beam. And uh, we're seeing about stresses that approach, um, you know, six KSI or so within that within that weld. Uh, the CMA specs call out a maximum stress for that particular um, type of joint as being about 13 KSI. So we're well within the specifications for that. And then this is weld C, which is connecting what we call the, the main support. Um, and it experiences very little um, stress in either loading scenario. So we're uh, fairly confident that that weld would not fail. Um, this is actually the location of the maximum stress um, from all at any location for any of the um, loading scenarios. And uh, for this one, I mean, we didn't we didn't do any analytical calculation for this for this particular location, just because it's a very odd loading scenario, and we didn't really know how to approach it. So we just kind of used we just kind of took the fact that our SolidWorks was benchmarked fairly well by our analytical calculations, and said that our our model was good for the stress within our structural members. And so, as you can see, the maximum stress is about 8.8 .8 ksi while um, the, the specifications limit it to two thirds of the yield strength for this particular material is 36 KSI, we're using A36 steel. And so uh, again, we're well within those specifications. Um, and then we've got a buckling simulation that we performed here. Essentially um, what this shows is that there's no threat of buckling uh, regardless of the loading scenario and uh, whether that be in the supports or within the actual transverse beam. And then we also did a fatigue simulation. And um, as you can see, the, the damage percentage, which is essentially um, how close it is to failing due to fatigue, only approaches 0.5%. So there's not really any threat of fatigue damage uh, kind of causing the structure to fail before um, before yield stress is experienced. Uh, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Blake for some prototyping and performance testing that we did. Okay, so um, as you can see on the screen, this is a dual hook design for the trolley. It's made by Saturn Overhead Equipment Company. 
And basically what Saturn lets us do with this specific trolley is where the lifting hooks are, we can make, we can do a custom distance. So what that lets us do is match it to the attachment points on the existing screens. So we can match those, that spacing exactly. And that allows it to take, to uh, take the load completely vertically instead of potentially pulling it, you know, in a lateral direction when lifting. And the twin hook design does provide more stability instead of a single hook with maybe a spreader bar. Uh, the dual hooks keep the, will keep the screens from trying to twist maybe in high wind or anything like that. And it helps whenever you're guiding them back in. You don't want to have to turn the screens. You only want to have to guide the bottom. So this is our prototype that we made. Um, it's as close to scale as we could get. Um, we couldn't really go full scale model because the trolley would end up being so small. We could not get it. We couldn't feasibly make a trolley that would actually do its job and be that small on the prototype without the prototype being massive. So we chose to do two screens instead of six, um, like two slots instead of six, like in the real project. And that allowed us to kind of scale our trolley up and get all the parts that we needed inside the trolley. So next we have a video of it actually working and that will show you what the actual system needs to do. And basically the hooks are lowering right now using the remote control that's shown on the right. Uh, we have a lifting and dropping button and also a left and right movement button. It's all wirelessly controlled, which is how it will be in the real system also it'll have a wireless uh, controller for the trolley. So you lift the screen and we're gonna move it over to the cleaning area, which is grass. And we're gonna drop it down and then the operator would spray it off with a pressure washer, you know, get all the grime off, get any debris that's caught in the screen off and you lift it back up. And we move it back over and get it aligned. And then there will be a little bit of intervention needed to guide the screens into the slots because the trolley is centered over the where the two screens go. So there's about a one and a half to two inch difference off of where the bottom of the screen would actually hang and where it needs to go. But we did the calculations for that and a human could easily handle pushing that screen into the slot. All right, so our project budget, which is for the actual prototype that we made, um, our biggest cost was hardware, which pretty much includes everything on the prototype except for the supports and the electronics that are in the trolley. Uh, so hardware includes, you know, the 3D printed screens, any 3D printed parts that we had. Um, it includes nuts, bolts. We have some eye bolts on the cable that holds the power uh, line up, which coils up. So that is a good bit of the project. Uh, the electronics are another big part. Those are mainly the stepper motors or the main price. Um, and then the supports are just the maker's beam and the uh, transverse I beam that the trolley actually rides on. So we came in about $400 under budget. And then, so our production cost, uh, main cost can be the trolley and the $15,000 is a two ton trolley which is their kind of middle model. They make the one, I think all the way up to four ton, but the two ton is adequate. And the 15,000 includes all weatherproofing. Has, it has heater coils in the motors because it will be exposed to, uh, potentially exposed to water, especially you know, out in the weather. Uh, basically that keeps moisture from building up on the coils of the electric motors. And it has covers for the cables and stuff like that. So pretty much weatherproofs the trolley for the most part. And um, labor includes painting uh, the system and welding as well. So overall, um, we went with a W18 by 106 wide flange beam, which is for the transverse beam. We went with a W1482 and a S1025.4 for the supports. Um, like I said before, the twin hook trolley seemed to be our best bet as far as stability and reliability goes. And the custom spacing of the hooks makes it very useful for this situation. Um, we're anchoring it to the concrete. 
using a flange and five, uh, 16 grade five wedge anchor bolts. Um, so that would be two flanges, obviously one for each support where it attaches to the concrete. Um, the welding is going to be one and a half inch welds, and that's going to follow the AWS code. And we do recommend that there be an added layer of paint or any kind of corrosion protective, uh, corrosion resistant material on the outside of this. Um, they, Clico did inform us that their water is mostly pH neutral, so to protect their pumps. So that does help us. So corrosion shouldn't be a huge issue, but we still do recommend adding a coating to prevent corrosion over many years of use. Uh, does anybody have any questions for us? Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and kick it off. Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, uh, you answered my first question in your last sentence. Uh, I was gonna ask if you consider cooling tower environment the use of chlorine or bleach neutralizing agent that might increase corrosion. Uh, so we already covered that one. Um, did you guys perform a time study with operators in the current method of how they do this? Um, how is that process ergonomically? Um, do they have to lean over to attach those hooks onto the filters or they stick up above ground grade? Just that kind, those kind of considerations. So I'll start with the hook question about the operators. Uh, currently, from our understanding, they do have to lean over the edge, but they are tied off. There's a handrail that goes all the way around the platform. And so they do tie off uh, for OSHA regulations and stuff like that, and just for general safety. Um, so we wouldn't be changing that. They would still have to attach, bend over and attach the hooks to the eyes on the screens. That wouldn't change. Our main goal is to, one, make it to where one operator could use it. Um, instead of having a crane operator and an operator hook it up, uh, or one, I guess, could go back and forth, but that seems kind of excessive. But basically, um, we try to maintain the same process, just kind of take one of the operators out, which would be the crane. So this operator could have the wireless remote on a harness or on, a, on his belt, however he wants to carry it. And he can mostly single-handedly do this process is what our goal is. Which kind of as you sorry as you can see, see uh, the it's pretty close um, to the actual platform. Uh, it could be rigged up pretty easily using some sort of uh, just sort of extended grabbing uh, device. I, I, we believe that'd be pretty feasible. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I have one question. Um, was there any consideration to a maximum load deflection um, saying that you had all six screens on the beam at one time just to kind of see how much um, the beams actually deflected? Well, we're I mean, only doing um, one screen at a time. That's the uh, general uh, procedure that we're going to follow just because um, it, with one operator, it would be uh, more... I guess chaotic if they tried to work with multiple screens at one time. But um, we did the we did the deflection with the maximum. I'll, I'll go to that slide real quick. Just the the maximum load that we would expect um, using one screen, and we did a deflection analysis of that, and it was within the specifications that we were uh, that we were looking at for deflection. Can you go back to that picture, Austin, that we were just on a minute ago. So for clarification, um, only one screen is going to be picked up at one time. Uh, there are two guide slots. So right now, uh, the filter screens that are over on the right picture for scale, uh, those are spare screens. They will put one of the spare screens behind the existing screen and then pick up the screen that needs to be cleaned, move it to the side, clean it, put it back in its place, and then they can remove that spare screen and put it at the next slot. So they'll only do lifting one at a time. Right. They, they want to keep a screen. They don't want to have to shut down a pump. Uh, at any point, so they keep that spare screen behind the primary screen so that there's always a filter between the cooling tower and the pump. Um, so they can really, I guess, if they really wanted to, they can maybe do two at a time, but currently they only do one. They expressed their interest was only in doing one at a time. I guess that's what my question was kind of leading to. If there was an improvement on this project, would your current um, suggestion work with 
doing multiple screens at the same time. Um, and I just wanted to know if you guys considered that that's, that that was the main question. That's a that's a good question. I think in order to do that, we would need multiple uh, multiple trolley systems, and the the main cost of this whole thing is the trolley hoist system. So um, doing that um, would just about double the cost of the whole thing. So it probably wouldn't be economically advantageous to uh, to do that approach. Okay. And then another thing to consider is they only have three spare filters, so we wouldn't be able to do all the filters at the same time unless they had another incurred cost of buying new filters, filter screens to go in the, uh, there's only three spares. So. Um, question from my end. So when you did your, your like maximum deflection load calculations, um, I assume you were just using kind of the weight of one screen. Did you look into kind of what was the required load test to kind of qualify the weld in the system? Um, usually those things are kind of like more than what you're supposed to use, right? So really your, what the, the system's going to take is going to be more than um, what's typically operating. It's kind of basically like a proof test of sorts. Did you look into yeah, that? I'll, I'll take that one. In the uh, CMA specifications, I believe it calls out a proof test for 125% of the, uh, of the rated load. So um, I think we actually did it for for, for like kind of taking into account um, like just an over an overload so we so yeah it it's definitely within that kind of 125 percent range so I think any any kind of proof inspection proof loading would be uh would 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 pass for sure All right, we've got a question from the, the chat uh, from mm -hmm. Phil asking if, can the current concrete foundation support the new weight um, of the system since you're attaching it straight to that concrete? Yeah, so we did some uh, more detailed calculations on the, uh, the foundation, um, the bolt, foundation bolts in our, like in our, in our, in our report, we just didn't really get to do it, uh, have time to do it in our presentation. But um, as far as this concrete uh, strength, um, we didn't have adequate numbers to from Clico to go with there, so we just kind of used an average, um, an, an average like concrete value, uh, strength, compressive strength for concrete for that. And then uh, it also says wind load. Um, so yeah, that's another. Um, Another variable within the CMA spe specs, there's a, there's just a um, there's essentially like a factor that you that you add into your um, analytical calculations uh, in order to take into account uh, wind loads and then also any kind of uh, increased loads due to inertial forces from the acceleration of the screen from when it's you know at rest to when it's being lifted, um, and so all of those um, are taken into account in our analytical calculations. Uh, I guess we didn't really do anything with our solid works for that. Like we didn't impose any sort of um, any sort of horizontal loads that would that would um, correspond to, to wind loads or the uh, or the inertial loads. But that's a that's a good suggestion, and uh, and that's yeah, that'd probably be something maybe a good double check to make to double check our analytical calculations. Yeah. Um... Hey, really good answer to that question. Um, I know it's something I didn't consider a lot when I started working in a refinery, but uh, there was a certain bearing load that should have been calculated for that foundation when they built that cooling tower. And um, you really just want to look at, you know, is that foundation in compression or tension, especially when you hang that screen off the end of that platform? You know, are you, are you changing from compression to tension in that foundation? I probably doubt it, but... Um, depending on how tall it is and what the surface area is, surface area of everything is, you know, forces can uh, multiply as that screen moves out to the end. That's, that's, that's definitely a good point. And uh, we kind of, that's, that's why we use so many bolts spread out over a very, a pretty large area just to ensure that the, uh, if there is any uh, tensile forces acting on the, uh, on the concrete that it'll be able to just uh, be spread throughout the, the different foundation bolts. So to uh, touch on the question just asked in chat, 
Uh, was there an ergonomic comparison as far as timing to complete the job of removing and cleaning one screen uh, current versus the proposed? So right now that they told us uh, the current process of cleaning the screens takes roughly half a day towards the full day. Um, based off of some of the prototype testing that we did and the average speed of the trolley, uh, the time it takes to uh, clean, use the whole system and clean the screens is going to be relatively close to the same amount of time uh, in large part due to the main time is actually cleaning the screens themselves. Um, however, it will save time in the sense that only one operator will need to be used. And the fact that uh, currently while one's uh, controlling the crane, the other operator has to go and hook it up. So it'll be a lot easier with one operator using a remote control can already be there to hook it up as he's using the remote control. So you'll save time hooking up the screens and then moving them over. Y'all may have answered this, but, uh, or it was maybe in your presentation, but how big are these screens exactly and how heavy are they? So they're, um, I'll take it. Uh, they're, the, as you can see on the right side of the screen, the screens are roughly 20 feet long um, and they weigh about 2,000 pounds a piece, um, 1,500, 2,000, depending on which screen it is. Um, so that's kind of a calculation that we did. The finer screens, which are closer to us on the picture on the left, are weigh a little bit more than the coarse screens just because there's more material uh, on them. Okay, something maybe to keep in mind, and I don't know um, if, if all companies follow this regulation, but oftentimes if there's a large piece of um, equipment that they're trying to pick up, if it's longer than say 15 feet, there's a requirement that you have to have a spotter um, to operate a crane like this. So, you know, instead of just one person operating this crane and cleaning it, you really have to have two because OSHA says, hey, um, you need a spotter because you can't quite see over 20 feet or whatever the case may be. So um, I don't know if that's something y'all considered during like the process of if, if you needed a spotter or anything like that, since it is such a large um, screen that you're picking up. That's a good point. Uh, we didn't see anything within the specifications that we read through or the OSHA specifications that we read through. Um, we might have missed that, but that's definitely another that's a good point that um, I'm sure Clico probably knows, the Clico personnel probably know more than we do about their, their procedures for that. Sure, yeah. Just something to be mindful of if, uh, you know, they do put it in place because it sounds like a really good solution. How, how are they cleaning these before? With a, like a, a mobile crane that they would bring in. I think they owned it, but they would bring it in and just have to basically a crane operator and then a rigger that would that would they would drop it down and they would rig it up and then they would uh, do it like that um, pretty I no. guess, straight kind of cumbersome and dangerous really yeah all right well with that I do need to move us on to the next presentation thank you um, cooling tower gantry system um, great job thank y'all crushing wheel gantry system if y'all are ready to share your screen and come on y'all are welcome to all right take it away when y'all are ready hey everyone uh, thank you for viewing our presentation today. We are the Crushing Wheel Gantry System team. We are seniors here at Louisiana Tech uh, University in Mechanical Engineering. My name is Grant Jones, and I've been doing purchasing and procurement this quarter. I'm Catherine Coleman. I've been a designer this quarter. I'm Hunter Bushner. I've been the team lead this quarter. I'm Colin Phillips. I'm also the designer this quarter. So we also have been working for Clico Corporation. Is LLC. They're headquartered in uh, Pineville, Louisiana, but the facility that we've been going to is in Lena, Louisiana. It's also known as the Brain Energy Center, and our sponsor contact has been Jeremy Brimer throughout this process. One of our project has pretty much been revolving around is this coal pulverizing tower. It crushes coal into a fine powder using a crushing wheel, and the clamshell you see depicted there seals off the crushing wheel uh, area to pulverize the coal. And in the picture, you can see it's at the fully open state. And once at the fully open state in the current process, it sits on jack stands. And to open this is actually a two part process as they have it right now using a pneumatic jack and a gantry crane. The pneumatic jack, as you see depicted in the bottom there, 
opens it to an equilibrium point, and then the gantry crane is connected and the jack is removed. This is a very big safety risk, and we want to mitigate that in our project uh, because the total weight of everything is 45,850 pounds. So these pictures are going to depict how that process is currently run. So in the picture on the left, uh, this shows the clamshell fully closed, and in this position, they will attach the pneumatic jack. Once the pneumatic jack is on the clamshell, seen in uh, the picture on the right, it will then push the clamshell all the way open to the equilibrium point. Once at the equilibrium point, the crane will be attached to the clamshell, which is shown in the picture on the left. Once the crane is attached, it will, uh, once the crane is attached, the pneumatic jack is then removed from the clamshell. On the picture on the right, it shows the crane then lowers the clamshell all the way down to where it rests on the jack stand. So our known information, as Hunter said earlier, the total weight of the clamshell and wheel assembly is 45,850 pounds. In this facility, there are six pulverizers with three clamshell doors and one crushing wheel assembly per door as seen on the right. In this facility, they have an N plus one redundancy system, which means that five of these pulverizers are running while one is on standby waiting for maintenance or otherwise. So the biggest point of this project was to find the equilibrium point. With this, we can determine designs and we can figure out uh, analyzations for our final design. So once we found the center point, we figured out the equilibrium point is roughly 28 degrees of the fully opened. So our project requirements is that we need to provide a safer work environment. As Katie explained, that there is a transfer between uh, jack to gantry and we need to remove this process to have a more efficient system of opening and closing the clamshell and a more streamlined process. We also work with different space limitations for each of the clamshells, especially on the west side. As Colton was saying, there are some limitations to this project, especially on the west side of the facility. You can see in the picture on the right, there's a very large duct that runs along the side of this facility and it runs in front of six of the 18 pulverizers. So the design that we had to use had to incorporate that we don't have as much space as we would in, were initially anticipating. There's also a whole lot of other equipment surrounding the clamshells. And there's also a very small foothold on the ground for possible design. And you can see that the only concrete floor space available uh, for this particular pulverizer and clamshell is depicted by the blue outlines. This is the worst case scenario clamshell. So the design team designed around this and the design for this clamshell will work for all 18 clamshells. And as you can see, there's also a label for metal paneling. Uh, there's either metal paneling or metal grating all around these clamshells that has various equipment underneath. And that cannot be, that paneling or grating cannot support any type of load. So we have to use the concrete floor. And then the picture on the right, the clamshell is uh, again outlined just for reference. And you can see the structural support members and the other equipment surrounding each clamshell. So for a successful project outcome, as we've mentioned, we have to have a design that opens and closes these clamshells in one continuous motion, uh, basically taking out the switch between the uh, pneumatic jack and the gantry crane. And this is about a 46,000 pound operation. So we have to keep that in mind during design. We have to create a 3D model of everything that we're going to be implementing. We have to have a full set of drawings, and then we also have to have a working and operational prototype. So this is one of the alternative designs that we considered while uh, going through this project. This was called the electric motor and gear train system. The system includes two motors po positioned on the pivot point of the clamshell. This design option was determined to be complex and expensive. Finding a gear train and motor to fit this application was difficult and the only options available were custom built parts, which were very costly. Another reason why this system was costly was because each of the clamshells needed to have its own electric motors and gear train system, because this wasn't a mobile option. Another alternative design that we had was a double hydraulic cylinder system. This system included two telescopic hydraulic cylinders that were attached on either side of the clamshell. The picture on the right shows the, well, just one of the hydraulic cylinders that were considered. 
and the other one would be in an identical position on the other side. This proved to be expensive as well because this is also not a mobile option and the hydraulic cylinders would have to be custom made as well. But this is also um, the way that it opened the clamshells could potentially get in the way of the maintenance, uh, hindering the availability of the space um, so that they could get in and out the, excuse me, so that they could get the crushing wheel in and out. So here is the final design. It is a single hydraulic cylinder lift system. As you can see, the arrow is pointing towards a hydraulic cylinder. Uh, this design only needs one cylinder as it will be a mobile cylinder. And this cylinder itself at full extension will be about 15 feet long. And at full compression, it will be about seven or eight feet long. And this is a double acting telescopic piston so that it can push and pull underneath its own power. This piston will be powered by a mobile hydraulic cart that is run off of electricity provided by the plant. And uh, unlike the other systems, this is a mobile system. So the piston and the hydraulic cart can be moved to any clamshell, any of the 18 clamshells, but the mounts that are in the concrete and on the clamshell will stay attached and there will be mounts for each one of the uh, clamshells. So here's our decision matrix, just a little bit of uh, how we went through deciding which one that we were going to use. Basically, it's uh, about safety and cost, ease of use and availability and how long it takes to do the process. And as you can see in the green box, our hydraulic single cylinder did win out out of the three options. So the next part, we need to determine a redundant system. Uh, for, our, for the other two designs, they have a built-in redundant system that we could have easily operated. But for this one, due to the fact that we have a single hydraulic cylinder system, we had to create one. Now, we believe that this option is the best one where you have a two stands that they already have at their facility, but you modify it with dampers for the base. And then you have an airbag system on top that can hook to the pneumatic that they have up there. Um, more analyzation will need to be conducted in order to make sure that this is the best option. So here is the prototype that a design team has created. This is a 1 12th scale model. As you can see, the crushing wheel and the clamshell were modeled on SolidWorks and then 3D printed on a 3D printer. And the pulverizer was fabricated by a machine shop in West Monroe and the electric cylinder was bought from an online vendor. The electric cylinder was used because we could not find a hydraulic cylinder of this size that uh, had the stroke length that we needed. So basically just due to availability, we had to use an electric cylinder, but it still gets the point of a cross of uh, the actual prototype. And this is a short video. There's gonna be three video segments showing uh, the operation of our prototype. They're cut into different lengths because it takes about two full minutes for the prototype to fully close and then fully open back up. Uh, one very cool thing that we did with this was that uh, our prototype actually has the same equilibrium point as the full size, uh, full size version at Clico. So when the uh, clamshell is open to 28 degrees, it will not fall or uh, open but when it's at less than 28 degrees, it will slam shut against the pulverizer itself. And then when it's past 28 degrees, it will fall towards the jack stands. So for our engineering analysis, we looked at the force acting upon the hydraulic piston, the stress and strain on the clamshell and floor mounting hardware, stress and strain on the piston connection pin, the steer stress of the clamshell weld groups and we also looked at the concrete anchor bolts, energy dissipation required for the redundant system, and the cost analysis. Let's jump on into the force on the cylinder. Three different data sets were obtained, full scale force values, which were computed using a mathematical model, knowing the uh, forces and geometries associated with the project. The prototype force values with values which were gathered by the prototype, and we'll get into that in a second. Projected prototype force values, which were gathered with the same mathematical model as the full scale, however, using the prototypes, forces, and geometries. And again, this was used to justify the mathematical model for the full scale values. For the prototype, the values were recorded using an S-type load cell in line with the piston uh, and different lengths of all thread, all thread to form different uh, discrete angles of opening. And this uh, was read with the digital readout and Arduino. Five values were recorded and averaged 
these all this data was put into a graph along with the full scale data and the projected prototype data both the prototype data and the projected prototype data had to be scaled up using the weights of the prototype versus the full scale and here we can see that for the most part they do uh, have the same trend however in the low angles of opening and the high angles of opening there is a big discrepancy and we'll get into that in a second but it does pass through 28 degrees at zero force in all three cases and that discrepancy that i talked about as you can see in the red we have pretty large percent errors between the prototype and full scale data and the projected data and the full scale data is mostly due to the purchased electric cylinder that we had as you can see the mounting hardware is quite a bit different from the 112 scale to the full scale this the full scale of course is the one that we designed ourselves however that being the case the projected data versus the prototype data still came out to a relatively low error uh, throughout the entire process so it did validate uh, the use of our mathematical model. So for the next part, we looked at the materials that we'll be using for it. For the mounts, we'd use cut and welded half inch and three eighths thick sheet stock. And for the pins, we'd use two inch diameter rod stock. For the mounting hardware uh, material, we would use for the clamshell connection, A572 grade 65 steel. And for the floor connections, we would use A36 steel, but we can also use A572 grade 65 steel. For the pins, we'd use ASI, AISI 4130 steel. So let's get into some engineering analysis for the clamshell mount. As I mentioned before, these were modeled, and uh, these were modeled also in SOLIDWORKS and simulated in SOLIDWORKS undergoing forces. The maximum forces we found were from a fully closed state and opening. Here we can see the von Mises stresses equivalent strain displacement, maximum of which is placed at the red portions, as you can see in the pictures. These values were backed up using a hand calculation. The hand calculation we matched to the simulated calculation was the normal uh, force strain, stress, excuse me, uh, normal to the z axis, as you can see the top left, and using the full, uh, free body diagram at the right. Uh, the prison error came out to be 4.2%, which is pretty close, so it did validate our simulated. Uh, model. We also did this for the floor mount. In this case, the maximum forces were from a fully open state and closing. Uh, again, we can see the stresses, strain, and displacement that the, that the SOLIDWORKS model did give us. And this was also tried, we attempted to back this up with hand calculations. However, there was a quite a big percent error. Uh, the percent, uh, the bearing stresses calculated were considerably higher than the uh, simulated values. We don't know if that was an issue with the calculation or the simulated. Uh, but more analysis needs to be on the, done on this. And uh, we also have the factors of safety of each of these uh, mounting hardwares. Um, the clamshell mount, worst case, was above the 1.5 uh, that was specified to us, uh, the A572 um, being used for that, and the worst case being the hand calculation stresses we, we found against yielding um, was found to be less than 1.5. However, if we did beef that up with the uh, A572 uh, steel, or we use the simulated values, we would achieve a one, above a 1 1.5 uh, factor of safety. So for the next part, we looked at the shear stress on the piston pin. We found that at the worst case scenario of the amount of force on the pin, the clamshell mount and the floor mount are above 1.5 and are sufficient for this system. This is an analysis of the worst weld group. Um, the, we use the connection for the clamshell because this is where the worst case force was found. So on the picture uh, on the right, you can see the four weld groups that we used. We assumed that they were identical weld groups and the worst case force was when the clamshell was fully closed. The, we also assumed that the part was free to move instead of attached to the clamshell, which would have provided more support for the welds. So this is a free body diagram that we used um, to find the correct calculate to find the correct equations for the weld group. The factor of safety ended up being 0.4, and this is really low because of the assumptions that were made earlier. A more in-depth analysis then that would take into account more of the weld groups and the ridge of the clamshell needs to be made. Another option could be that the um, that a, another, a second connection point could be used with the first one to distribute the load across more area. 
Another engineering analysis that was done was the concrete anchor bolts that would be used to fasten the floor mount to the concrete. Three different strengths were calculated. Uh, first and foremost was the tear out strength that would be, or the force that would uh, be undergoing any floor mount or mounting bolts. Uh, and to achieve a 1.5 or above factor of safety, two stainless steel expansion anchors from Hilti at a one inch diameter and a six inch embedment depth or higher was found to be sufficient. Um, and also the bolt shear was calculated and the concrete factor of safety uh, was calculated um, in that 45 degree angle cone you see there. And both of those were well above 1.5. For the next part, we need to determine the energy dissipation of the worst case scenario of the door, say failing or the piston failing. So the worst case scenario would be at the equilibrium point one is slamming closed and the other is falling down. For the one that's slamming closed, the energy absorption that we need at the top of the clamshell will be roughly around 340,000 foot pounds. And for the one that is falling down, you would need an energy absorption of roughly 2,300,000 foot pounds. So the last engineering analysis that we did was the payback period for this. And the payback period is focused on how much uh, the company would save per year based off of just labor of the current process compared to the, to the new design. As you can see, it, uh, it's a quite a large payback period of 27 years. But since this project is really focused around safety and uh, the safety of the workers and everybody who's involved, this is an acceptable value. And then there's also a production budget. We were allotted $120,000 for this project. And we have come in just under $120,000 uh, and about a little under $20,000 per pulverizer. And the bulk of this cost were due to the hydraulic pistons we have to buy and also the labor for the, uh, the mounts and the redundant system. And this value may be different once the redundant system is finally chosen. The, the analysis for the floor connection factor safety and the weld factor of safety need to be reviewed and reevaluated because they aren't up to the standard that we need them to be. All the other analysis were sufficient for this project. And there are several other redundant systems that have been suggested that are in the report. The prototype is complete and operational. We have all of the drawings and 3D models completed. Clico will be receiving these as well as procurement information for all of the parts for the final design. And the design is under budget. So some broad considerations is how the system will affect the health, the safety, and the culture of this plant. The health, it will mitigate many of the health risks that were um, brought forth with the current system that they have now. The safety, we remove that current design current safety concerns that there is with it. And with the culture, we had increased the system efficiency, improved labor process, and decreased the labor that is at this facility. Does anyone have any questions? Well, yeah, good, good job team. Uh, really like the design. I like how y'all went with the effort in the design that uh, could actually be applied to all of the clamshell doors versus just something that has to be mounted to each one individually. Um, I do have one, uh, one of my questions is, and I may have just misunderstood, around the load measuring you did with the load cell, um, I saw a very clever uh, technique to do it for the prototype, um, but y'all mentioned a full scale uh, load that y'all were comparing to in senior error difference. Um, did y'all go out to the plant and actually be able to measure the load of the same angles of the doors out there, or was that just a scaled value? Unfortunately, we weren't able to actually measure the any force values uh, in full scale. That's why we, we pitted the uh, projected force values that were found with the angles and the forces that the prototype was undergoing. Um, so we found the centroid for the prototype, which is very similar to the actual centroid of, that we did for the full scale model. Uh, as well as the distances and stuff that we used uh, in the mathematical analysis of the full scale model and uh, just ran it again with different numbers. Um, so to answer the question, no, sir, uh, those aren't uh, actual values. It's just, just a mathematical model. Sounds good. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, I understand it's probably hard to get out there and, uh, and actually get some real world measurements of this. That's going to require some pretty beefy equipment. Right, um, right. Another question around your analysis of your, your mounting points. Um, did you guys uh, look at 
the actual sh stresses to the rib itself where you're intending to weld your mount point to to ensure the actual clam door structure could take the loading no sir because we we were told that it was it was it's two inches in, in uh thickness and solid uh so we assumed in our analysis that it was rigid uh however that'd be a good point uh, to make that it would be uh, if that would be able to take the load okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you for the questions yeah one question um with the piston being removed and replaced and moved over to different clamshells or whatever. Um, was there any consideration for tilting or misalignment? Uh, that's to say, is there any room for error or is there any window for error uh, to make sure that your system actually works? Well, there's always room for human error, um, but the, the connections are set up in a way where if they are both connected, there wouldn't be any, and, and properly placed on both the floor and the clamshell, there wouldn't be any possibility for misalignment. Um, however, it, it definitely could be a possibility if those two requirements are not met. Does that make sense? Yes. And then I also had one more question. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you said that you were trying to make a safer work environment. Can you quantify in a measurable statement how you made the work environment safer. Grant, you want to take that one? Yeah. So basically, we're, we talked about that equipment change going from the pneumatic jack to the uh, gantry crane that came down. Well, they, there's, there's been an incident where that's actually the, the clamshell has slammed shut in the past. So we basically took out that two-step process of changing equipment, that, that quick equipment change and just made it one continuous motion to open it. So there's no equipment change. So that's going to increase the safety for the workers. As to um, add into this, also at the question that was in chat on how exactly are the operators making the change between the jack and the crane separately, they're actually standing on the lip of the top of the uh, pulverizer. There's a small lip that's on there that they stand on there and then they actually pull and they actually get, I think it's a, um, a, uh, what was it called? A uh, scissor lift and actually pick up and get rid of the uh, jack while well, they have one person standing on top to make sure that it's unhooked. And so there's one person on top of that pulverizer, which is not a very safe process. Good questions. Uh, another question I uh, thought of, uh, going back to your uh, design constraints in the beginning, you looked at the concrete versus uh, metal plating uh, mount area at the floor. Uh, how, how will your new design connect to the concrete? Because it seems like that single cylinder uh, would come right in the middle of your two concrete foundations and land on the actual deck plating uh, for that picture you showed earlier on in the presentation. But I might have just uh, not seen not not be imagining how it's connecting correctly. That's understandable. Uh, Katie, if you want to go back to that picture real quick. Um, actually, the area you see in blue on the on the right side of that picture is exactly where the clamshell will, or the piston itself will sit. It'll be recessed about eight inches into the ground so that whenever it's disconnected, it will not be uh, a tripping hazard of any sort. So pretty much right where that arrow is, a little bit closer to the pulverizer itself, it will be where the format actually is okay excellent and and did you guys do any i guess you did a pull out strength calculation or determine you know with the hilti bolt for your anchoring but can that concrete actually support a you know, forty five thousand pound point load you know, or it is end up, that, go ahead sorry okay or would you you know chip it out and you know pour an epoxy grout with some anchors or anything like that that was an option that we, we looked at. Um, however, just the, the single hammer in, drill in uh, um, expansion bolts provided the best tear out force uh, that I found, at least in my research. I, I may be wrong, of course, but uh, um, we were, it is believed that the concrete is sufficient enough. I believe it's 18 inches or so, if not more, uh, in, in, in thickness. Uh, the facility that is above this is quite large and it's a standard 40,000 
uh, PSI uh, compressive concrete. So that is definitely a possibility that should be looked at though. I agree. Thank you. I've got one more question unless Jenna has something. I had something that may be very simple. <laughs> um, so y'all ended up with a um, hydraulic system, right? Did y'all consider, you know, other sorts of, of pneumatics such as, you know, a pneumatic system and y'all mentioned an electrical system as well. Um, if you did have other systems that you looked at, why was hydraulic the best option in this case? Well, we picked hydraulic originally. Originally, we had actually uh, electrical and pneumatic systems. We had a pneumatic ball screw system that was similar to uh, the jack they use. However, the forces that were, were handling uh, hydraulic was, was the only one that would be able to uh, both push and pull that clamshell open uh, reliably. So that's why the ultimate why we put why we picked it. Good. Go ahead, Phil. So that was kind of part of my question. I love hydraulic systems. So I didn't see anything about like the actual hydraulic cart. What sort of hydraulic pump are you using? What's the uh, cleanliness requirements of that oil system? Uh, do you have dual filters on that cart? Do you have an RV set up for high pressure? What pressure are these hydraulics going to have to run? Um, we do actually have a uh, hydraulic cart specified, and I think Grant uh, has the most knowledge about that. So, Yeah, so the hydraulic cart is going to be a mobile hydraulic cart from Foster. It's got a 40-horse uh, electric motor on it, and it's got about, I think it's a 28 GPMs is what the flow rate of the uh, pump is. And it's got about a 60-gallon reservoir on it, so there's plenty of time for that uh, fluid to cool in it. Uh, there is a uh, one-return filter on it It's in itself. And then what was the other part of the question, please? You are muted. Phil, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, the other part was, I mean, just in general, I didn't see any information about it. So you know, do you have an RV on your hydraulic cart? You know, who designed it? And then the cleanliness requirements of hydraulic systems are very important. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's manufactured by Foster, and it's running at about, I think the one that we selected was based off of our piston, which was 2,000 uh, PSI, and uh, that's about all the information that I know off of hand. Okay. We'll definitely have to look into the cleanliness, the requirements, though, considering it is a coal pulp, uh, pulp processing plant, and it does get pretty dusty in there. It does have a return filter on it though for, for cleaning. Appreciate all the questions, guys. Good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great job, guys. Um, so it is a little past three o'clock. Um, we have scheduled right now a 30 minute break. Um, when we originally scheduled these presentations, we were still hoping that we'd still be able to get together and have these in person. Um, so you can take this time to walk down to the, the rotunda in the Integrated Engineering Science Building and grab you a cookie and some, some Coke. Um, it's a pretty long walk for most of us, so you'll have 30 minutes to get there and get back. Um, but we are still going to take that 30-minute break. Um, feel free to hang out here in the Zoom. Um, I think at least the past two teams are still on if you want to chat with them or if you want to chat with the upcoming teams or if you just want to chat about the weather. Um, but we'll start back up here at 3.30 um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen again with that. Um. Ethan, do you want to take a minute? I mean, share your screen all, but let, I guess let the board introduce themselves. Uh, I mean, they're free to take breaks, but you know, we could utilize like a small portion of the time if they have questions and wanted to get to know the board. I know we usually do that in the fall. Um, but, uh, a lot of seniors usually don't make much of that. So this was a good time for them to kind of like, you know, ask people that have been working in the industry for five plus years or Phil who runs the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, for, so for the students who are here, Phil, um, you know, I guess if, if the board, if you'd like to go around and introduce yourselves, um, that'd be a good place to start. Chris, you want to go ahead since you're the first on my screen? I don't know if that's the case for everyone else, but. Yeah, I can definitely go ahead. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Chris Kotar. I am a 2018 graduate, so only a short two years ago, I was uh, in your position providing these presentations as well. 
Uh, currently, I'm working at ExxonMobil Chemical Plant down in Baton Rouge um, as a machinery engineer. So over a bunch of different rotating equipment uh, at that plant. And uh, so I, I, and I've also dealt with the cooling tower uh, pump filters. Uh, so it was pretty interesting to see that screen project if uh, anyone from that team is still on board. Uh, Finn Lamb, 2014 graduate, um, mechanical engineering, worked a little bit in oil and gas for GE, um, now working for Interlock's um, conveyor belt design systems and software development. Brantley, you're next on my screen. Okay, uh, Brantley Johnson, uh, graduate 2014 as well, um, worked for General Motors in Detroit, Michigan, currently the accessory product manager for our mid-sized trucks. Um, Jenna, I guess you're next. <laughs> hey, I'm Jenna Sanders. I'm also a graduate from 2014 in mechanical engineering. Um, I currently work at Lockheed Martin as an operations engineer um, for that program. My father works at Clico and I'm originally from Pineville and I'm sitting in Pineville right now. So woo, go Pineville. <laughs> All right, Phil. I'm Phil Tucker. I uh, currently work for ExxonMobil. I worked for GE for a bit uh, right out of college. I'm the uh, rotating equipment technical lead for power plants, utilities, oil movements, and uh, water treating in uh, ExxonMobil in Beaumont. Um, and graduated 2011. I don't know if I said that. So, glad to be here. Thank you guys. Really good presentation. If there's any questions, you should have the, the ability to unmute yourself. Um, so if it gets too chaotic, I'll, I'll moderate a little bit, but feel free to unmute and chime in. Hey, I would like to know if there are any students out there, how the end of this quarter has gone for y'all with all of the changes, um, especially with senior design. I know um, me and a couple of the folks in our 2014 group, we've been talking about, about like, man, what, what would have changed in our senior design project if we were all separated or if we couldn't meet together and actually physically build this project. Um, so I'm curious from y'all's perspective, the changes that y'all had to make to make this successful by the end of the quarter. Really for our, our project, since since most of it was already built before this whole COVID-19 stuff, so we weren't separated in the actual building of it. And two of us lived together, so uh, it wasn't too bad to get any kind of modifications um, on it. Uh, but for the most part, it was difficult just getting everything streamlined. Uh, and Zoom with their 40 minute cap kind of sucks. <laughs> but other than that, it, was, it wasn't too bad. I'll say kind of from the instructor side and it looks like Dr. Reeves was here, but he stepped out. Um, I, I've been really impressed with the way, at least the, the teams that I mentored um, handled the, the transition and then the classes that I've taught. Um, the students have been amazing as far as how well they've handled the situation and kind of the grace they've given back to the professors in the situation at hand. Um, you know, Again and again, we're shown that LaTeX students are top notch and they handle handle things in stride. So I've been able to you know see that firsthand, and it's been um, it's been good to see. So the, the students definitely deserve applause for how well they've handled what is a pretty yeah, crummy situation. Them. Yeah, and for all you seniors, I mean, man, <laughs> it, it kind of stinks that that y'all are kind of in your senior year of a very difficult program and doing well and so kudos to you even if you don't get it even if you don't get to walk right now keep it up it, you know y'all are doing good things we appreciate it
All right, hey everyone. Um, so we'll start back up here in a few minutes. Um, so we've got three more presentations this afternoon. Um, again, they'll each be about 30 minutes in total and it's with questions. Um, and then after that, um, the session awards ceremony is going to all, all three sessions are going to have one awards ceremony or um, I guess a ceremony. Yeah, we'll call it that. Um, and Dr. Cardenas is going to host that. So as you'll, you know, you can see the schedule here on the screen um, at the bottom there. That's so the session awards will start at 515 and then that is um, the URL you can you can type in directly to your browser to get there, or if you are on Zoom, um, those numbers at the end. You do that. um, that's like the, the meeting ID. So you can just type those directly into Zoom um, when you ask, when you tell it that you're going to join a meeting. So that's where you can find that. And I'll drop, I'll drop a I'll drop this URL in the chat um, towards the end of our session. So you can copy and paste it if you would prefer to do that. All right, if the micro mullion team is here, I'll stop sharing my screen so that one of you can share yours um, and you can go ahead and start once all of y'all are ready. Looks like we've got our advisory board back, so we're good to go. One second, sorry, just making sure everything's working properly. Uh, all right, um, hello, we're the Micro Mullion Mate team, also known as the Mullion Mate 2 team. I'm Kyle Beardsley. I'm Gary Cody. I'm Andrew Huck. Um, Lucas, it looks like you still muted. Oh, it. Sorry, go. I'm Lucas Waldron. Um, all right, so briefly, I'm going to talk about what we're going to go over. We're going to we're going to talk about the background of our project. We're going to go through the deliverables and the different requirements we needed to meet. Our chosen design and some design alternatives. Our engineering analyses and performance evaluations, and then we'll finish with our conclusion and acknowledgments. So. Our sponsor is Gordon Incorporated. They're based in Bossier City, Louisiana, and our contact is Eric Sorensen. So the question is, what is a mullion mate? Well, a mullion is the metal bar on a window that holds the different panes of glass together. So if you wanted to set up a partition wall or something that would go across the window, then there would still be an 
a gap in between where the mullion and the wall are. So Gordon has a product called a mullion mate, which is a spring-loaded expanding metal device that can you can place into the gap and it will fill that space and it can be cut to whatever length is needed. Now, Gordon has a wide variety of different sized mullion mates already, anywhere from two and three quarter inches to over a foot long. However, they do not yet have a mullion mate that can fill a smaller gap than that. So they tasked us with designing a micro mullion mate. These are some of the deliverables for our project. Uh, our our smaller mullion mate is looking to fill gaps from two to three inches. We're looking to make it cost effective. It needs to cost less than $20 per linear foot. Uh, for ease of installation, we're looking to, to be able to install a 10 foot section in another seven minutes, and that's, that's for one person, one person. We're looking to exert a minimum of six pounds per linear foot for a three inch gap. This is to ensure that the mullion mate stays fit in the gap. Say if someone bumps against the wall or some small force is exerted so that it does not tip over and we're looking to exert a maximum of 12 pounds per linear foot for a two inch gap. This is for any small safety concerns or also in the case where uh, the millimate is between a wall and a window. These are some of the requirements for our design. Uh, we're looking to keep, uh, to use aluminum extrusions uh, with finish options and we're following the, the style of the existing millimate line. So our final design should look very similar to what they already have. Uh, ease of assembly, so it needs to be able to, it needs to be very simple uh, when it's assembled before it's shipped out and it needs to be able to be modified on site uh, so that they can cut notches um, and things like that. This is our chosen design. This is what our final design looks like. Uh, you see here, this is an insert extrusion and a receiver extrusion on the bottom. Uh, in blue, you see that's the gasket. That's what's making contact with the wall or mullion or window. Uh, there's our spring and in green, there's there are tombstones, which are the guides that sliding along those rails. There is foam inside. You can't see it, but we did choose foam insulation. And in red, you see our brackets, which are our insulation tool that's compressing the mullion mate right now in this model. There are a few uh, alternatives that we uh, considered early on. Um, we're looking at torsion springs, but looking at how we would have to fit it into the design, it's, it's pretty complicated and it wouldn't really fit into ease of assembly. And it would also make disassembly and reassembly on site for end users more complicated as well. And we also considered using foam as the main expansion force without any kind of springs or anything inside. Um, however, this would require high density foam and that's pretty expensive and that doesn't really help us be cost effective for our $20 per linear foot. And here are some of the design alternatives we had for our installation tool to help with ease of assembly. So on the left, you can see one of our first ideas, which was to uh, put holes in the side of the mullion mate and hold it uh, closed with pins. So the idea there being, when you go to install, you just remove the pins one by one and allow it to expand. Uh, this was ultimately rejected because uh, we did not want to have to drill holes into the side of the mullion mate as that would change uh, the outward appearance uh, when it's installed. And that's something that we were asked to keep um, the same as Gordon's current mullion mates. And on the right, you can see um, our original bracket design. Um, the sort of process for removing these brackets is that you would grip the tab that's at the top and you would sort of peel it down. Um, there was a little bit of difficulty getting off the bracket right at the end, so we added an extra little tab uh, to, provide with, to provide you with some leverage to help with removing that. All right, so now we're going to go through our engineering analyses. We're going to talk about our force analysis, which we'll go into all of these in more detail. The force analysis to make sure we met those force requirements. An extrusion deflection analysis to make sure that the uh, mullion mate is not deflecting when it is in the brackets. Contact stress of the spring on the extrusions. A spring buckling analysis. Bracket deflection and stress to make sure that these brackets will not break or deform and the cost analysis to make sure we're meeting that $20 per linear foot requirement. 
So to start with, as Kyle mentioned, we're going to go through the force analyses. Uh, we did one at two inches and at three inches. Um, and so what we're looking to show is that at two inches, we're not exceeding 12 pounds per foot. And at three inches, uh, we need to make sure that we meet at least six pounds per foot. So on the right, what you're seeing in gray, that would be the extrusion. And this sort of section um, would repeat every 11 inches for however long the mate happens to be. Um, F sub F is the force, which would be a result of the foam that we're using for insulation. And F sub S uh, is the force from the spring. So on the left, you see some information about the spring which we chose and a representative spring constant, which we experimentally determined for our foam. So skipping a few steps, uh, we sum all of the forces together and find that the total force being exerted over this 11 inch section is 10.688 pounds. And adjusting that maximum force, which was 12 pounds per foot to what we would need for this 11 inch section, uh, the maximum force is 11 pounds of force. As you can see, uh, we did not exceed that. Doing the same thing for uh, when we're filling a three inch gap, um, at this width, the foam is no longer applying a force, so the only force that we have on the extrusion is the force from the spring. And so the overall force, as I mentioned, is just from the spring, 5.522 pounds. And again, adjusting that minimum force, which was 6 pounds per foot, um, to what we would need for an 11-inch section, we needed to achieve at least 5.5 pounds. And so as you see, uh, we have exceeded that. Next will be our extrusion deflection analysis. What we wanted to show with this analysis was when the mate is fully compressed and we have the brackets uh, on, that the extrusions are not deflecting away from each other so much that it would cause a problem or be uh, noticeable. So we have recommended the, that the brackets be spaced 22 inches apart. So this is a 22 inch section um, of the mullion mate and the forces that uh, we would see in a worst case scenario. And so what we want, uh, in, in order to show uh, that it was not a problem, we have kind of over-exaggerated uh, the case to show that in an absolute worst case, over-exaggerated situation, uh, we still do not have to be worried about uh, the, the deflection. So what we're going to do is sum all of the forces together and apply them directly at the center in between the two brackets. So totaling all the forces, we get about 25 pounds of force. And treating this as a simply supported beam with a concentrated load in the center, taking into account the elastic modulus of our aluminum extrusion, the length, which I mentioned was 22 inches, the second moment of area of our uh, the cross-section of our extrusion, we find that the maximum deflection would be 0 0.006 inches, uh, which we have determined is not uh, anything to be worried about. So our next analysis was for the contact stress of these springs on the aluminum extrusion. So you can see in a, the picture on the left that the springs are not going to be perfectly resting all on one flat surface. They'll only be contacting the tracks that the tombstones slide along at a few specific points. And you can see on the right a kind of graphical depiction of what those points would be. So we needed to make sure that the springs would not be exerting so much force that it would cause the tracks to deflect or bend. So, we so a spring will be exerting a, a maximum of nine pounds of force. And the area of those patches is about three times 10 to the negative two square inches. So it, there will be about 290 PSI of pressure being applied. Our, the yield strength of aluminum is about approximately 10,000 PSI. So our factor of safety is about 34. So we're not concerned about that yielding. So we have our analysis of our spring. Looking at spring buckling, this is something that we need to consider while getting our spring to its operating range, where the tombstones that it's resting on actually overlap. And a good rule of thumb is the slenderness ratio. An indicator that your spring will not buckle is that you have a slenderness ratio that's less than four. And uh, looking at our spring's dimensions, we have a slenderness ratio of 3.59. So we're confident that our spring will not buckle from free length 
uh, to solid mode. And here we have the bracket flexion analysis. This is for the case where the milliamate is uh, fully compressed and the brackets are placed on, which is the worst loading, uh, loading scenario for these. Um, it can be divided in half with a symmetry line and one of the bracket arms can be treated as a cantilever beam. Um, and while calculating this and comparing it to uh, a SOLIDWORKS simulation, there's a 0.1% error and the actual value of the flexion is so like 1.3 to since to negative three inches, very small, naked to the human eye and very acceptable for our brackets. And here we have a bracket stress analysis for the same scenario. Um, and calculating this and comparing, we had something like a 3% error, uh, still very close, and uh, the brackets are made of stainless steel. So considering this for a factor of safety against failure, uh, we have a factor of safety of three, which is also acceptable. We will continue to use stainless steel for the brackets, or Gordon can use stainless steel for, for their brackets. Here we have the cost analysis, and we took the cost of each item per foot and added it up, and it came out to be 1940, which is below the $20 that Gordon wants us to have. For um, force testing, we used a postal scale for a one foot section, and they wanted us to have, a for a gap of two inches, a max force of 12, and for a three inch um, minimum force of six. We had someone push down and hold the extrusion at the desired gap length, this provided an imprecise way of testing as the results were pretty inconsistent. And this is most likely due to the human error of trying to hold it and down at a constant force to keep it from fluctuating. And this was done because we were not able to get a proper test rig set up. So we had to make do with what we had. And here are the results we got. As you can see, they're inconclusive because of previously mentioned issues in testing. Uh, but we are confident that with a proper testing, we would have reached the desired force. But these values are pretty close to what we wanted. So we thought it was acceptable. For assembly testing, we had three people together assemble it and tape it up and we recorded the time that it took to assemble it. Uh, and Gordon didn't want the assembly process to be overcomplicated, so it doesn't take too long to assemble. Here's the trial runs and the times we recorded. Um, this was pretty varying due to human error as well as uh, later on, we were able to optimize the assembly process so we were able to cut down the time pretty significantly, but there was still some variance. And for installation testing, uh, Gord wanted us to be able to install a 10 foot million mate in under seven minutes. So we created a test rig with a two and a half inch gap to do this process and we recorded the times. And here are the times for the different trials, which is all well below the seven minutes that Gordon wanted. So overall, we met the requirements that we were originally given and we've created an acceptable working prototype and Gordon Incorporated is prepared to start producing the Million May 2 for the market. And they will, they have told us they have plan on continuing to adapt it and change it and further optimize it as time goes on. We would like to thank Gordon Incorporated for sponsoring this project and producing the extrusions, tombstones, and brackets that we use, and for just being flexible with us through the issues with coronavirus and some of us not being still on campus and their site not always being accessible. In particular, we'd like to thank Eric Sorensen and Rob Rombo, two of the senior engineers at Gordon who are direct points of contact and for giving us a lot of good feedback and advice. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Reese, our faculty advisor here at Louisiana Tech for giving us a lot of regular feedback and helping us figuring out report formatting and testing 
analysis and just a lot of great help. Does anyone have any questions? Um, around uh, developing the design concept, uh, is, is the way you in, uh, utilize the springs with the helicoil springs, is that uh, in line with their full size mullion mates um, where there's this kind of, uh, due to trying to fit it in the smaller size requirement, uh, did that require a completely different uh, spring installation? Yes, Gordon's existing mullion mates use compression springs and they have, it, it's a slightly different, it's different springs because of the different sizes and force requirements. And it's different, a different tombstone design. Theirs are much taller. So we needed to redesign tombstones and and use different springs. But yes, they, they use a similar design. Um, and this is just a small consideration, but did you guys think about anything with uh, weather as far as contraction and expansion with changing hot and cold, with it being in between wood and, and the window? Was there any kind of consideration? I believe that we were told at the beginning of this project that um, we did not need to take into consideration, uh, for example, like wind loads um, on the window as you know, it's spring loaded. So as long as it's still able to uh, expand and contract, uh, it wouldn't be bearing any load. So it wouldn't be uh, a, a concern. Okay. And then um, for the installation, um, were you guys able to document what steps actually helped you improve on your installation time? So for using the, or for, for the installation tool itself or just the, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand your question. Well, in your times it was very, it was varied. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to crack down on how you guys um, improve so well. I know. For assembly? Are you talk oh, yeah. We're for talking about the assembly or installation? Because the installation was pretty consistent. For the, uh, so for the assembly, we're working with a 10 foot section. And it was a lot of it was timing um, and spacing. And as we got used to um, basically a set procedure, um, so I guess it was just like, just experience with spacing and compressing at the exact same time. And uh, because you have to you have to space the tombstones and place the springs and then you uh, have the insert into the receiver and then you have to tape it and all of that. So we just got more used to timing and doing it all like consistently together. The times that you saw were some of our early attempts at doing it. So we had, you know, we had a chance to practice it and improve and figure out what we needed to be doing a little bit differently. So if you have someone who's experienced at putting together at putting together mullion mates, then that time those times would be more consistent. But those were just our early attempts. Yeah. And regardless, all those times were acceptable. Is just we saw improvement over time, which is why there's a change in assembly. Um, during your explanation your, uh, of your, not FCA analysis, but deflection analysis and uh, <clears throat> physical calculations, you made the comment that six thousandths of deflection was acceptable. What was your basis for that, I guess, and what is unacceptable deflection? And I'm, I'm not quite sure what component you were actually analyzing at that point. I thought it was like the whole length of the, the millimate, but what was your basis is the question. Why six foul acceptable? Right, so uh, you're right in that it was the uh, the mullion mate, the, the actual extrusion uh, that we were looking at deflecting, and so it was between two of the um, uh, two of the brackets. So that was about over a two foot section, um, and that, as we mentioned, that six thousandths was uh, a very very over exaggerated case. But uh, comparing the deflection, like how much it's actually pushing up compared to the thickness of the brackets themselves. So the brackets themselves were uh, made from sheet metal, which was 0 0.0625 uh, inches thick. And so the 
main concern was we did not want it to be um, we did not want it to be uh, deflecting in such a way that it would cause it to be difficult to place into a two inch gap. Um, and then as well, we just wanted it to not look uh, as if it was weak or flimsy, that sort of thing. Okay. Also uh, for your FEA analysis and where you're applying loads and deciding on spacing, did Gordon provide you with any scenarios or how this should be tested? Uh, assume they, they already have new, new mates out there on the market. They should have been able to provide you with a, the proper way to perform your FEA analysis. Does that make sense? Uh, are you talking specifically for the brackets? Um, it looked like it was your actual moon mate that you had your FEA for. So like, I guess the, the long extruded uh, piece of metal and you were showing forces on it and how, and how much it moved. Right. So um, that is not a sort of calculation that um, they would have previously done because uh, it was sort of resulting from those uh, brackets that we placed on the Millennium 8, which is kind of a new uh, tool that we developed specifically for this product. Um, and that was mostly because with that really small two inch gap, um, there was concerns that it would be really difficult to uh, install as you weren't able to like previously with a wider gap, you'd be able to fit your hands, you know, in between the Mully Mate and the wall and made it a lot easier to maneuver um, and to peel off, for example, the tape and that sort of thing. So uh, this was kind of a new tool that we were asked to develop um, since we were filling such a small gap. So is the company planning to use this installation tool in the future for the Mullium Mate 2? Uh, yes, for this smaller Mullium Mate. Uh, they have told us that they're planning on using this. Do you know if it um, made any sort of measurable efficiencies? And I'm sorry if that was already asked before. I don't know if that's something Brantley brought up. Um, but were there any sort of efficiencies, time efficiencies from using that installation tool? Or was it all just sort of ergonomic because of the tight space? Mostly ergonomic. So we didn't do any trials uh, without the tool as it was pretty much, as we mentioned, it, it was very, very difficult uh, to install without those. And so we weren't able to do any trials without the tools. So mostly for ergonomic reasons and just being able to install it. I, I was the one who was doing the installation. And during the winter quarter, we also did some experiments with a shorter, a four foot section. And it was just difficult to work, it was almost impossible to get tape off easily. So we, it, 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 made, it made the installation possible as opposed to, like, I, I couldn't quantify it. It was mainly ergonomic. Did anyone else have any questions? I might have seen something in the chat, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask two questions because I, I put one in the chat and I have a follow up. Um, so one, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how does a mewing mate actually, I guess, work? Does it have to be up against the mullion that's connecting pane to glass or can it be directly up against glass? And then the second question is, did you guys actually redesign the Mullion Mate or really just the tool for installing a smaller Mullion Mate? So for the, for the first question about can it be placed directly against the glass, um, there are different rules about how much forces it can apply. I believe Gordon has a different line. They, I, they, I believe it's called the glass. I'm not quite sure of the exact name, but there are different there are different ways that it needs to adhere. This one is designed specifically to be against a mullion. Okay. Yeah. And regarding the design, we did keep, so their existing ones are the U-shaped aluminum extrusion with the tracks going along them for a tombstone to be slid along. We needed to adjust the thickness of it and the thickness of the gasket in order for it to work for a smaller scale in addition to designing an installation tool that could be used. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you for asking. I have one more question. Was there an FEA, a SOLIDWORKS FEA analysis on the extrusion or was it just the installation tool? Just on the installation tool. Okay, so the extrusion is when you had the, the force analysis and the hand um, deflection analysis, right? Yes. Was that for a smaller 22 inch section? Did y'all do that for the entire 10 foot section? Um, so so that 22 inches would be just the spacing between uh, two different brackets when uh, the whole million mate is um, sort of closed up and the brackets are placed on there. So that same situation would be happening every 22 inches. Okay. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, good job team. Uh, will you mate too? Uh, Y'all can see. Thank you very much. All right, we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule, so we'll hang out for just a bit before um, we start the next presentation. But next up will be Dino Balanced Beater Bar team. So I know I've seen a couple of you in here. Once y'all are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, just give it a, another minute or two before you actually get going. That looks good. Let's give it another minute or so and we'll get going. All right, y'all can go ahead and take it away when you're ready. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michaela Bell. My name is Gregory Gilbrogi. My name is Bryce Swanye. Trace. All right, Trace. We, you here? I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, I'm muted. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm Trace Ramsey. Right. Today, we will be presenting our senior design project, the Dynamically Balanced Theater Bar. To start off, we're going to go over some company information. Our company's name is Frosty Factory of America. It was founded by the Williams family in 1982, right here in Ruston, Louisiana. The Williams family they owned Wilmart, which was the local liquor store and they were really unsatisfied with the current frozen drink machines that were on the market. So they set out to create their own. Fast forward 30 years, they now ship everywhere in Louisiana and even nationally to places like Detroit, Dallas, and Las Vegas. And they even started shipping globally. Our company sponsor, our main contact at Frosty Factory is Ralph Pettijohn. He is the chief engineer at Frosty Factory and he was a graduate of tech and he's been there for over 30 years. So the main part that we're looking at is their uh, nine inch diameter drum model, uh, 137A, uh, looking, at the or looking at the bar itself inside the drum. This bar rotates inside the drum, scraping ice crystals that form, creating that slush consistency that you see in your drinks. Now this machine has a problem with it. Uh, due to the vibration of it, it causes the seal 
to uh, fail prematurely, causing the liquid inside the machine to leak out into the back parts, ruining the machine itself and your drink. Uh, this vibration also causes the machine to wobble, bumping into things around it, and in extreme <coughs> cases, uh, can walk off tables, breaking itself. Shown here is the beta bar assembly that we were tasked with modifying and its individual components. To start, there is the driving shaft of the assembly to which everything is attached and the rotary seal is uh, slid onto. Next is the Delrin scraper that is designed to be in constant contact with the inside of the drum in order to scrape ice crystals and form the slush that is desirable in frozen beverages. The spring shown here is what keeps the Delrin scraper in contact with the drum. The counterweight acts to balance the Delrin scraper while in rotation and is designed in such a way to push the fluid from the back of the drum to the front of the drum for easy dispensing. The aft bracket serves as the face in which the spring for the rotary seal makes contact and serves as mounting points for the Derwin scraper and the counterweight. The forward bracket also mounts the Derwin scraper and counterweight and is made in such a way that allows the counterweight its ability to propel the fluid to the front of the drum. Some of the specifications in which we are basing our project off of is that we are redesigning the nine inch diameter beater bar. This beater bar is used in a variety of models across the company. We are working to dynamically balance it in order to improve the seal life as well as reduce, reduce machine wobble. Some of the things we had to work around include uh, making sure that the function is unaffected by any of our design changes. Those functions uh, will be listed later in the presentation. Our final product also has to be easily removed from the machine. We could not change that aspect of it. Uh, and early on in our design process, we were asked not to include a second Delrin scraper as this would drastically increase the cost of the beater bar assembly. So as Bryce said, machine function should be unaffected. That means the product needs to freeze about the same rate as the old mixer bar. The product needs to dispense at the same rate and the product taste must not be changed. Some standards for the machine material. It must be food grade material, resistance to ruts and cracks. It has to be free of any crevices and it must not impart flavor, color, or odor to the fluid of the machine. All welds have to be smooth and any internal angles and corners should be radius. Here are the government standards for what I said for the metal and for the Delrin as well. Next is our design selection. Here we have the current beater bar. When we first received the beater bar, we created a 3D model in SolidWorks so we could analyze any forces on the beater bar as well as the center of gravity. Going through some of our design considerations, we first came up with the simple idea of just adding a little bit of material to the counterweight. Early on, it was determined that the Delrin side of the beater bar was heavier, thus uh, setting off the center of gravity. So adding this small part would require no additional welding. It would just be a larger piece cut out on the laser cutter. The second design, considera design consideration we had was the same idea of adding weight to the counterweight, but instead of adding it on the laser cutter, we would add it with a weld. The third design we considered was removing weight from the Delrin scraper itself. This wouldn't require any additional components and would be a simple machine process to update the existing Delrin scrapers. The last design we considered was adding a Delrin contact bar to the counterweight. Although we were told not to add any more Delrin, this was just in case they had a change in what they wanted. So going over our design matrix, we broke it down into four different categories, cost, ease of manufacturing, vibration potential reduction, and uh, ease of testing. After talking with our contact at Frosty Factory, uh, Ralph Pettijan, we broke these down into an importance with vibration uh, potential, vibration reduction potential as the most important, and the ease of testing as least important. Uh, after uh, comparing all of our design choices, we determined that option three had the best with ease of manufacturing and vibration potential reduction, uh, topping it. Like Greg just said, we wanted to go with removing weight from the Darwin scraper. This would allow us to move the center of gravity closer to the center of the rotating shaft, which will help us increase seal life. This will also help reduce some turbulent flow behind the scraper bar to help reduce vibration of the machine. 
This will require no additional components. And like I mentioned earlier, it is just a simple machining process. After tossing, talking with Frosty Factory, this was their preferred choice. Here we have a look at our prototype down and scraper. You'll notice the slot is cut at an angle because when the beater bar is rotating in the machine, it is not perfectly flat. So this angle allows the fluid to flow straight through it without coming at it at an angle. Now for some of our engineering analysis. So after we made a SOLIDWORKS model, we determined the center of gravity of each individual components. And using this uh, and the equation above, we were able to plug it into SOLIDWORKS. And after playing with the numbers, we were able to determine that we needed to remove 28 grams of Delrin from the scraper. Looking at the original center of gravity, it's not quite on the center. And after looking at a prototype, it's much more closer to the center of gravity. So to see what the fluid would do inside the machine, whenever we put the beater bar in, we wanted to do some computational fluid dynamics. Before we actually put it into a full assembly, we wanted to see how the uh, original Darwin scraper would act just in a straight flow simulation. In this picture, you can see a lot of recirculation and turbulent flow behind the scraper, which we hope to reduce with our new Delrin scraper. After throwing it in the machine and zooming in on our area of interest, we can see that there is a lot of recirculation and a large area of turbulent flow that we hope to reduce with our prototype Delrin scraper. So looking at the prototype Delrin scraper, you can see a lot of that turbulent flow and recirculation has disappeared in the straight flow simulation. And when we look at the full assembly model and we look at our area of interest, we can say that there is still a little bit of recirculation, which we want to keep to help mix the fluid, but we can see it's a lot smaller and more neat, which we think will reduce the vibration of the machine. We also conducted stress calculations on the Darwin scraper in order to verify that the modifications made would not affect the structural integrity of the part. To assure that the simulation matched our calculations, the stress of the point indicated by the arrow was calculated with the same simulation values as SOLIDWORKS. The manual calculations yielded a value of 54.0 PSI, while the SOLIDWORKS showed a stress of 56 PSI. This shows that our stress values throughout the simulation are within an acceptable range of accuracy. The original Delrin scraper has a stress concentration of 334.91 PSI, located at the point indicated by the arrow. Uh, this stress value, when compared to the yield strength of the Delrin, has a factor safety of 27.28. When the slot is added to the Delrin scraper, the location of the greatest stress concentration changes to the location indicated by this arrow. The max stress is shown to be 660.53 PSI, which is concerning since it is nearly double the previous maximum stress, but when compared to the yield strength of the material, it still has a substantial factor of safety of 13.83. This shows that our design will be strong enough to operate under normal operating conditions. We analyzed the cost it would take to manufacture a slot in the Delrin scraper in-house. So we took the estimated pay for a machinist in the Ruston region, which was $25 an hour, and the estimated machine time for a single Delrin scraper, which was seven minutes, to come to the cost of a single Delrin scraper, which is $2.92. So our sponsor said that they manufacture around 30 machines per week. So that total would be $87.60 per week on top of the cost of a Delrin scraper itself. So to compare this cost on the next graph, we have the initial cost of a new mold itself. So the initial cost of the mold is $10,000. So compared to the cost of manufacturing in-house, $87.60 per week, it would take almost 2.25 years to overcome this initial cost. But afterwards, the, initial co the cost of a new mold is the better option. And this is, of course, assuming that the cost of the new Delrin scraper is the cost of the old Delrin scraper. So next we have our engineering evaluations. For vibration testing, we acquired a slow motion camera and we used a pattern background, such as the picture on the right, to help us capture and quantify the vibration frequency. However, this data would be, wouldn't tell the whole story, so we also needed to capture the amplitude data. To do this, we used a marker and a blank piece of paper, 
and we kind of did an old seismograph type deal measuring the amplitude of the machine wobble. Looking at the frequency data, we can see on average that the original Darwin scraper had a frequency of about eight and a half hertz, while the prototype Darwin scraper had a frequency of about 7.35 hertz. This is an overall reduction of about 13 and a half percent, but we needed to look at the amplitude to see if we actually reduce vibration. And looking at the amplitude, we can see that the original Darwin scraper had an amplitude of about 0.6 centimeters, while the new prototype Darwin scraper had an amplitude of about 0.5 centimeters. On average, we did see a reduction. However, due to our error bars, we can't say for sure that the new Darwin scraper will cause a decrease in amplitude. The next test we conducted was a blind taste test. We had one machine with the current bar that Frosty Factory uses and another machine that had our prototype bar in it. And using a variety of testing fluids, one being uh, sugar water, which was a combination of four gallons of water, five pounds of sugar, which is the way Frosty Factory tests their, all their machines. Uh, then we used Welch's grape juice, Gatorade, margarita mix with and without alcohol. Since this machine will be, uh, one of its purposes is to serve alcoholic beverages, we had to make sure the alcohol did not affect the taste. And during this test, it was concluded that there was no difference in taste uh, with our bar and the current bar that they're using. Another evaluation conducted was the freeze time of product. A function that we were not allowed to affect is the time it takes to freeze the standard testing fluid, which consists of sugar water, as described in the previous slide. The standard freeze time for the model we use to test is approximately 30 minutes. After several trials, the average freeze time was determined to be 29.3 minutes for the original Delrin scraper and the and 28.7 minutes for the uh, slotted Delrin scraper. This shows that our slotted Delrin scraper does not negatively impact the freeze time of the machine. Our final evaluation was the dispense rate of the fluid. So we took a machine and filled it with a sugar water testing fluid and measured how long it would take to fill a 16 ounce cup with a time of 50 seconds in between each trial to wait for the, fr the fluid to refreeze so that the data was more accurate. On the next slide, you can see a graph of the old data for the old bar and the data for the new bar. Uh, the old bar for, was an average of 7.1 seconds and the new bar was seven seconds average. So as you can see, there is no discernible change between the dispense rate. Our budget for this project was $510. And here's a breakdown of our expenses throughout the year. Travel expenses were $7.50. Machining the prototype was $20, and to get our final report hard copy professionally bound was $110, leaving a remaining budget of $372.50. Production budget for the company, as I previously stated, the best case to go with is the new mold, which is $10,000, and the cost of the new scraper will equal the cost of the Delrin scraper. And of course, it will take two in a quarter years to overcome the initial cost, but it's still the best case scenario. Some conclusions that, about our engineering analyses that we are able to come to. Uh, 28 grams of material must be removed from the Delrin scraper in order to bring the bar into balance with the center of rotation. Additionally, the uh, reduced turbulent flow from this design can reduce machine vibration while still allowing the fluid to mix properly. The prototype Delrin scraper has an increase in internal stresses, but will maintain an acceptable factor of safety for its life. And it will take two and a quarter years to overcome initial costs of the new mold. Some conclusions of our engineering analysis. The new bar re can reduce vibration frequency up to 13 and percent. And our prototype can reduce the vibration amplitude, but due to the error bars, it's not a significant difference. So we can't really say. And then there is no difference in taste, there's no difference in freeze time, and there's no difference in dispensary. A couple of recommendations we have for further work on this project would be a camera that can capture video at a higher frame rate than the one we had. This would allow us to capture more accurate frequency data. 
And we also think that improved vibration reduction could be achieved by adding dampers inside of the machine itself. However, because this was out of the scope of our project, we did not pursue this idea. Is there any questions? How was the, I guess, like, did you look into how long the seal would last now? I mean, we talked a bit about the vibration, but the, the ultimate goal, right, was to stop the seal from failing early. So the seal normally lasts for about five years and Frosty Factory was saying that the machines were only lasting two to three years. So even if we left the machine running from the day we got our first bar to now, the seal life would still be fine. There's no way for us to really test unless we just kept it running during that time. Uh, another problem with this is we weren't able to find any uh, hard case data on this type of rotary seal that we were using. If it was a pump seal of a certain type that's used in a refinery, we would have been able to find lists and lists of reliability data. But given these simple rotary seals, we weren't able to find any backing data for that. And what was the scraper made of? Uh, Delrin. Oh, okay. Didn't know it was Delrin. Yes, sir. I have a question on the design of the, the slot that you guys made. Um, typically when you have rotational items, um, it's not always a linear uh, removal, um, especially when we go like example, be like tire balancing, they might have two different quadrants that are unevenly balanced, but it might be a three quarter weight and a half a weight on the other side. I'm just kind of wanting to know what are you guys considering different kind of styles of the area that you removed or did you concentrate on areas that were having some of the the high concentrations of wobble so i believe uh could you please repeat your question i my mic kind of, or my speaker kind of glitched out yeah. on me so like you guys you you cut out a linear section of 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 your piece, right? Yes. And when you have rotational items, sometimes it's not just a linear piece. I'm asking if you guys consider alternate designs of the same amount of weight removal, but in different design patterns to see if anyone functioned better, got less turbulence, had more flow. Um, we just, did initially have uh, other designs rather than the straight slot. The reason that we selected the straight slot, uh, one, because of the, was one of the best that reduced turbulence, but also adding extra geometry other than that straight slot produced a smaller radius of crevices that wouldn't have been great for a food service product, if that makes sense. Okay. It would have been, it would also like very uh, greatly increase the uh, amount of time it would take to clean that specific section. Right. Did you guys analyze any failed seals? Uh, I heard you, you know, allege that it failed due to vibration, but how certain are you, your team, your sponsor, that vibration is the root cause of the failure? I believe that the conclusion was made that vibration was the mode of failure because the center of gravity was not in the center of the rotating shaft. And because these machines were walking and wobbling a lot, I think the relation was made that the vibration was causing this premature rotary seal failure due to the uneven vibration of the beater bar inside the machine itself. Yeah, so I, I asked that question kind of hinting or uh, adding on to Ben's question about the mean time between failure and five years. and it didn't seem that we really tested the vibration at the end of this. Um, you guys designed it and you made sure that it met the requirement, but the initial reason for this project was vibration failures on the seal. And um, I didn't really see where we tested that at the end, how much less vibration we got. Uh, that was discussed with the vibration frequency and amplitude, talking how the, we decreased the frequency and on average, we also decreased the amplitude of the shake of the whole machine. And we concluded that from the reduced vibration frequency and amplitude that we had improved the seal life. And you, you measured 
how do you measure the amplitude? We kind of did like an old seismograph where we attached a marker to the outside of the machine and set up a, a piece of paper behind it and turn the machine on, let it run for a few minutes, see the amplitude length that we got in the vibration. That's what we used. So part of our biggest problems of our project from the get-go was being able to measure this vibration. So we did research on different sorts of uh, vibe pens and like uh, it's different technology that's used to measure vibration. And anything that was reliable enough to use for this project was outside of the range of our budget. And as we went through the year, we were in contact with a vibe technician. I believe he worked in a paper mill in Arkansas. And our sponsor was setting up a meeting with him where he would come down with certain equipment, do some tests on our original setup, do some tests on our prototype setup. But by the time uh, this COVID-19 stuff started happening, that made it much more difficult to get in contact with him and be able to use that equipment. I have a question. Um, first, who got to test the margarita with the alcohol? <laughs> yes, that was all very important. <laughs> and just, secondly, to, just to clarify, since we're on recording, we are all over the age of 21 and this was not done on campus. <laughs> good job, good job. Um, secondly, can you tell me how y'all designed this um, Delrin scraper for better manufacturability? So with the, uh, with the, uh, oh, pardon me while I collect my thoughts. Sure. I made sure that the Delrin scraper was able to be machined with a single carbide end bit end mill, as well as the only machine that I had available to me is a router table. So I wasn't able to do too many fancy things where, where it comes to machining. So I designed and ma uh, manufactured a jig to hold the individual Delrin scrapers lock them in place and then the only thing that actually had to be machined in it is a like i said a straight s slot uh that's going vertically across the uh Darren scraper and this machining time uh took me about five minutes of setup and about two to three minutes to actually do the ma the machining and i was hand feeding it the entire time i wasn't using a cnc program which is reflective of frosty factory setup which they only have a single end mill or single mill that isn't CNC capable. It is hand fed by the machinist. Okay, good. I like y'all's analysis of the, the um, building in house versus outsourcing. That's probably something that the company was really excited to look at and see. Do you know what, I don't know if y'all mentioned it or not, what option they chose? Are they going in house or outsourcing? They are definitely going to go outsourcing. Uh, they prefer to have their Delrin scrapers already made whenever they come in. Sure. Good. From my understanding, though, they're waiting for their current mold to break before before they'll look into actually implementing this product, though. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, could you go back to your uh, CFD model slides, please? Um, I was looking at the essentially the flow arrows between your before and after, um, and could see where for the after it, it shows the flow of the fluid going through the scraper. Um, but on the before CFD, it looked like it also had it going through the scraper. So I wasn't sure if that was just a, a SolidWorks error or. I think that's a lot of, uh, I think like you said, a little bit of SolidWorks screen. error. Yeah. I think the main, we weren't really using these uh, initial tests as kind of like our final. We wanted to put them in the machine. So these were kind of just baselines of what we might expect to see inside the machine. Uh, I also, think, sorry. what were you saying, Bryce? No, no, go ahead. Uh, also, I think that it's a little bit of SolidWorks error, just the arrows are kind of glitching through the scraper itself. I think what we might be seeing here is that the flow is going around the Darren scraper towards us along the screen. So against that flat edge that we see the arrow in front of, I believe that's where the uh, flow is actually going in that specific case. Okay. If you flip back, I, th I think backwards, one more screen. Oh, sorry, it must have been forward. There you go. And when you zoom in there, I, I think this was the, the slide I was kind of thinking of in my mind. But again, this is probably just a generic uh, SolidWorks. Yeah, so. Drawing, essentially. Yeah, the way 
SOLIDWORKS, I think, works is you set the region to rotate. You can't set parts to rotate. So it kind of has a little glitch where it'll kind of show the arrows going through it. But it, it still gives us what we expected to see behind the scraper. So I've got two questions. <clears throat> One, I, I just want to kind of clarify Frosty Factory or someone else isn't going to have to machine this going forward. It's going to be cast in a mold, correct? Correct. So the Delrin scrapers are injection molded when they are produced. So the injection mold would have to be modified or in the case that it's more likely, uh, whenever their current mold uh, reaches its lifespan, they will produce a brand new mold with this design in it. So oh, someone is significant, but they're using less Delrin, so that it should be cheaper after they buy a new mold, right? Yes, sir. Uh, we did not know the uh, cost of the raw Delrin that the manufacturer uses. So in order to be conservative with our cost estimates, we use the same exact price of the Delrin. And then I heard another assumption about future cost and how it paying out or if you have to buy a new one. And two and a half years and I just kind of want to comment do you guys use a inflation like two and a half percent per year or just assume same cost that is the same cost there is no accounting for inflation typically you want to check around I think two and a half percent is probably a general inflation amount to use mm -hmm. um, but when you're doing an LCCA um, about two and a half percent per year and then bring that back to a net present value to compare options. Yes, sir. Got time for maybe one more quick question. I have one just out of curiosity, unless Ben, you want to go first? Go ahead. Um, we've talked a lot about the vibration testing. Where exactly on the machine did y'all place like the marker in the, the paper? I'm just curious, being nosy. You can most notice the vibration at the top of the machine. So that's where we place the marker. At the top of the machine being, orient me a little bit. Uh, Trace, do you want to scroll back to a picture of the machine? Yeah. That would be great. So it's so basically in that top left side. So if you look at the uh, picture of the machine, it was in that back corner area. Hey, Trace, why don't you go ahead and drag your mouse over the corner? Can you see, can they see the mouse? Can you yes. see the mouse? Uh, it'd be in this area. Awesome. Cool. Way to work with what you have there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a clever way to test. I thought that was, that was good. Thank you very much. Well, if there are no more questions, I think our, the next group should be getting ready to go. Uh, we thank you all for coming and uh, listening to us, and we're really sorry we weren't able to have free samples from a test machine in the room with y'all. Great job, guys. We're sad, too. <laughs> thank you all very all much. Right. So last but certainly not least, we've got the high STC Mullion Mate team. Um, I think I see a few of y'all have chimed in, so go ahead and share your screen. Yep, I can see that. So when y'all are ready, y'all can go ahead and move on. Okay. Uh, hi, hello. My name is Carla DeBray. I'm Joel Murphy. My name is Leland Smith. And I'm Ryan Willie. And we are the High Sound Transmission Class Mullion Mate Team. So a little bit of what we'll be going over today, we're going to start with a brief introduction and then we'll move into our project requirements, our metrics for success, our uh, design process, our budget, and then we'll conclude with recommendations and discussion. So our sponsor is Gordon Inc. They specialize in engineering products for exterior and interior architecture applications. Our faculty advisor is the wonderful Dr. Crystal Corbett and our professional sponsor is Vamsi Achanta from Gordon. So a lot of people probably haven't heard of what a mullion is. So basically it's a vertical bar, usually made of aluminum that separates window panes. 
Um, you usually see them in large uh, corporate buildings or any kind of large office building. Um, one thing to note is that a lot of times in these large buildings, um, when the construction crew is building the walls, they'll leave a gap in between the drywall and the mullion mate. And this is important because um, if, it, if the wall has, is in contact with the mullion, um, the mullion will actually deform uh, for, for various reasons that we'll talk about. And this can lead to cracking in the drywall. So they leave a gap right there. So Gordon actually has a product to uh, fix this issue. It's called the mullion mate. And what it does is it fills that gap in between the mullion and the wall. And um, some of the pros about it is it's easy to install. It's faster than traditional drywall. Um, it improves reliability of the interior wall because it expands and contracts. And they actually, they're the only ones with the product that can actually expand and contract to, uh, to account for that gap change based on the uh, deflection of the mullion. And that is due to wind and temperature. All right, so here's some more definitions that you'll be hearing a lot. Um, so frequencies, just a pitch. Um, octave bands, those are uh, organized divisions of those frequencies. Decibels or intensity of sound or loudness. Um, and then sound transmission class, which is what we're really worried about in this project, is basically a measure of a wall or any kind of object's ability to reduce the sound that is passed through it. Okay, so now that we have all those terms out of the way, we'll talk about our problem statement. So Gordon has tasked us to design a mullion mate with a composite sound transmission class rating of 60. Some of our parameters are that it has to be 16 foot long without splicing, and it has to have the ability to splice in order to make a longer mullion mate. It has to be able to ex expand between uh, four and 12 inch gaps. The design has to be extruded, easy to install, as well as easy to assemble in the shop production cost has to be equal to or less than $40 per linear foot and the expansion from the spring has to be three pounds per linear foot. All right so this is a video that's going to kind of visualize what the mullion mate is and how it's applied. So that's that's the mullion mate you can see right there between the wall and the mullion and after it's placed in there it's uh, bound by tape. You, you cut the tape and remove the tape on the uh, on the gasket and the spring inside of it just expands to fill that gap. Okay, so here you can see a cross section of the current mullion mate used by Gordon. It's two aluminum shells and there's a spring in there for the expansion and they're retained by these structures called tombstones. Um, the current STC of the mullion mate is 38. So there's a lot of room for improvement. We're aiming for 60 and the, um, the insulation on the inside to help with the sound dampening is called rock wool. So to start off with in fall quarter, we all realized that immediately that the weak point in the mullion made assembly was actually the mullion itself because most of the time they're hollow, just aluminum shells, so a lot of sound just passed straight through. So what you see in Carlos' design is that she internalized the mullion around and implemented, implemented two sets of uh, springs on each side all the way down. Joel went more of a tension spring maneuver method, and his kind of clipped onto the mullion. Mine just kind of encapsulated it, and I was going to use that red uh, area. It was going to be an experimental pneumatic device, and Leland's was just a um, perforated aluminum sheet wrapped around some kind of sound insulation. So we kind of took all these ideas and formulated them into a decision matrix, and what we came out of that with was that the aesthetic appeal and the uh, noise dampening were obviously the most important factors in our design. So if you look at number one, this is the first design we came up with in winter quarter. And the first one we're gonna talk about is the clip, which is what circled right there. And basically you would clip that clip into the, uh, the next thing that's gonna be squared. So you would clip the clip into those individual pieces and that's how you would uh, fill the gaps of various lengths as you can see, there's a couple missing components, like we didn't even get around to designing how it would expand because we weren't able to figure out a way to attach the clip to the aluminum sheet. So the next picture will be circling where the gasket channel goes. So the gasket channel for these designs were pretty much the same as the previous, with the exception of we wanted to make the aesthetic feel increase a little bit. So the idea was to um, what, narrow the gasket width so whenever you attached it to the glass in this case, you will almost not be able to see the gasket from the uh, building inside the building. 
So our next design, we finally we got around to uh, implementing a tombstone. So we designed our own tombstone in spring, and uh, we designed new tracks for the tombstone to ride in. And we designed this little uh, sleeve right here. So what this would do is we would attach it, and we would drill holes, and we would pop rivet it. We, in the end, decided to move away from that. And so what you're seeing here is the splicing mechanism for the beginning of one. Initially, eventually, we're going to have to uh, move forward to a design that would allow splicing on both ends. So splicing basically is you, shut, you slide aluminum uh, sheets into um, those gaskets and then pop rivet them so the mullion mates attach for a second longer than 16 feet. So on the third design, what you're seeing here is two tabs that are offset by just a little bit. And it may look like they're offset by a random amount, but it's a very specific amount. It's actually the specified pitch of the spring. So you're able to screw the spring into the tab and remove the need for a uh, tombstone pilot. So the next zero serves two purposes. The first purpose is to serve as a um, stoppage for the spring to screw into. So once the spring was fully compressed in that area, it would stop and even though you had to the spring fully. And also, as I talked about before, it, it served to splice the moines together. Here, we more securely um, fastened the aluminum sheet in, and we eliminated the need for a pop rivet, which is shown below. So now, instead of pop riveting it down below, it's uh, trapped between the uh, splicing mechanism and the outer wall of the mail carrier. And here, if you look at the last picture, you'll notice that it's a little bit difficult. You'd have to go straight in and this design allows you to be able to pivot the thin aluminum sheet and sort of uh, get it in there more easily. And this sheet also might look like it has to be pop riveted, but this entire chamber will be filled with insulation material. So that will be able to push it out and secure it in place. And then additionally, we also simplified the splicing mechanism. So it would be easier to extrude. Now, and that became our final design. So the next thing we'll talk about is the sound data gathering process. So first we had to build an anechoic chamber and we got a basis from, of this from Gordon's own chamber. Gordon's chamber was eight foot by four foot by four foot. We decided we didn't need a chamber that big. So we built ours a four foot cube and uh, we cut a hole in the front so we could put test, testing uh, uh, materials inside. And we also made the front of doors so we could go inside when needed. What you're looking at here is a cross section of the uh, and a coat chamber. So the outside and the bones of the structure were made of two by fours and plywood, seven, seven sixteenths inch plywood. After that, we filled the inside with styrofoam and we had filled it with three m spray on glue. And every layer was geared with three m spray on glue. So after that, was rock wool and then mattress copper, which is actually tempur and we researched that was uh, relatively the same as anechoic material because we couldn't find any actual anechoic chamber material. So after we built our testing chamber, we actually started testing. And this was accomplished by plugging an amp into a power source and then plugging our phone into the amp and generating frequency through an app that was allowed us to very carefully select what frequency, so directly on the octave band all the way up. And we conducted tests by performing five, uh, five data points for every octave band for every single test that we did. So it was a lot of data. And basically it functioned by, we would run through the gambit of the, the octave bands and we would pass the sound through the material, which is shown here in green, and we would have three decibel readers outside reporting data. So we had two phones using, we had one Android, one Apple, using different apps to record sound data, and then we also had an official decibel meter reporting sound data. And so we took all of that data and put it together. And so this is a list of all the various tests we did. So first we decided to do the individual materials with the original mullion mate. So we did about 10 or a little bit more uh, materials within the mullion mate. From there, we chose the best materials and moved on to a composite material data. And then after completing that data, we did a comparison between a perforated inner sheet and a non-perforated inner sheet just to see the difference. And then we also did the original mullion mate design compared with our double mullion mate design that fully captured the mullion on both sides. So what you're seeing here is individual examples of um, the five data points gathered at every octave band. What you're seeing are the error bars, the variance, and all the data. You see some materials um, 
had more variants than others. And we didn't show you all of the, the data at once because that would just be really cluttered. So we showed Cork and Rockwell, which were the best materials that we found individually. So then we took Cork and Rockwell in a, the next two best materials, NOICO and acoustic stuff, and we paired them together inside of the original Malay Bay, and we ran another gamut of tests. And we found that Cork and Rockwell did in, did in fact prove to be the best over all the optic bands. And so moving forward with Cork and Rockwell, we, we found that Cork blocks reverberation. Rockwell is just good for all around vocal insulation. So it, it's good at all octave bands. And then sound coat, which is the orange you see here, actually prevents metal to metal transmission of vibration. So um, you would begin the uh, assembly of this insulation by, you would first put the springs in, and then before sliding the yellow piece into the purple piece, you would fill the area between the springs with Rockwell. So that would be insulated as well. So then you would take the yellow piece without the uh, thin sheet and you would first put a layer of rock wool in, then you would put the cork sheet in and then another layer of rock wool and finally secure it. Uh, for the expansion mechanism, we also, we just use a compression spring, uh, just like Gordon's initial design, but we changed a few things up on the spring. Uh, we added the little extrusion lips that you could see um, on the female extrusion, which is the pink part that uh, holds the spring once it's compressed and screwed in. Uh, this, these little tabs um, create uh, the need or no need for a tombstone to be used. So there's no tombstone to hold the spring in place. Those uh, tabs will hold the spring in place. Um, and then the spring, the outer spring diameter is as wide as the inside of the female extrusion. So no lateral movement can happen when the spring is compressed. Uh, for the complete assembly of the mullion mate, there's actually two mullion mates, so they're assembled the same way. Uh, this is just a picture of one. Uh, you fill the male extrusion, which is the yellow piece, with the insulation, like Ryan said, then the cork, and then the insulation again. Uh, then you put the perforated sheet on top of that. It slides into place, and the force from the insulation actually holds the perforated sheet in place, so no rivets are needed. Uh, then you would screw the spring into the female extrusion and then compress it, tape it up, and it's ready for shipping. This is a picture of the installation, the, or the full installation of our design. You can see the wall, then the two mullions encompassing the mullion, or the mullion mate is encompassing the mullion. Uh, first, you would put the mullion mate in the gap where it needs to go, cut the tape, pull the adhesive tape down, it expand a little bit, keep repeating until the entire mullion mate's expanded in the gap. Uh, that's what you would see in the picture. Uh, this is our first prototype, which um, visually the design, they look similar from the outside, but this is just a little like um, example of what it would look like in the field. Uh, the white drywall you can see on the right, then the uh, checkered pattern would be the glass. The black block is representing the mullion. Uh, and then the mullion mate would fit on both sides of the mullion. Uh, only one mullion mate is shown in this because we, uh, Gordon actually made our prototypes for free and due to time constraints with the course and uh, since it was free, we didn't complain that only one could make it made in time. But uh, in real life application, there would be an identical mullion made on the opposite side of that mullion. Uh, our, for our performance evaluations, like Ryan said, uh, for the sound data, we tested uh, roughly about 10 materials uh, and got about four the top materials was rock wool, cork, acoustic stuff, and noiko. And then we tested uh, composite materials by combining those top uh, individual materials. And then we found that cork and rock wool yielded the best soundproofing. Uh, then we did a, um, a sound test data, uh, we did a sound test on the perforated versus non perforated sheet in the male extrusion to see if they uh, made a difference in soundproofing, which they did. We found the perforated sheet actually did better than the non perforated solid sheet. Uh, and then we sound tested uh, Gordon's single mullion mate versus the two smaller mullion mates, which our final design has. Uh, for our engineering analysis, a lot of the calculations came from designing our spring. Since our mullion mates are a lot smaller than Gordon's design, we had to re find out uh, if the smaller springs would yield uh, enough force to hold in place and expand uh, the amount of force needed to move the mullion in the gap. Uh, we had to find the uh, free lengths and compressed lengths and all that for the spring. Uh, we also had to find out whenever it's actually installed, if the exterior force 
uh, if someone can't walk up and just push on the mullion if it wouldn't collapse and then they'd be pointless uh, for the installation. Uh, when we found out that you would have to apply greater than 200 pounds of force to actually uh, break those gasket uh, seals and actually move the mullion from the side. Uh, we found we had to do calculations for the perforated sheet deflection to see uh, if it deflected a lot whenever the um, insulation was pushing against it from the inside. Uh, and it was actually very small force from the insulation's part, less than one pound of force. Uh, and uh, we also, from Gordon, told us that uh, if it's, the insulation's too packed, it actually has negative effects on the soundproofing. So the insulation can't be, it shouldn't be packed too hard, which actually decreases the force on the aluminum extrusion. Uh, and then the extrusion clearances, we had to go by uh, the Aluminum Association's tolerances to find out uh, whenever our aluminum, our aluminum um, extrusions are pressed through the dies to be created, uh, the tolerances need to be determined so that they wouldn't uh, compromise them fitting together whenever they're fully assembled. Here we have Gordon's third party testing results. So they actually tested a design that they had. It doesn't implement all of our results and all of our findings, but it's a very similar design. So they had three different design setups. The first one was just the solid STC wall. Uh, so here we see in red is the raw data that was taken through the test. And the blue is the uh, fitted line from the global, global standards of STC. So the blue line is what actually determines what the STC rating would be. Um, for the wall, we can see it is 68. Uh, when installing the mullion mate on both sides, so this is with two mullion mates on each side of the mullion, there was an air gap in the middle that tested at 59 STC. But then whenever that air gap was filled with rock wool insulation, it bumped it up to 60, which was our goal. So we believe that whenever Gordon does implement our design changes, it will be able, just the air gap will be able to reach the 60 STC. Here we have our project budget, which is how much it costs. Um, we had $2,000, $2,250 for our project. We spent uh, 479 of those dollars. Uh, most of it was used on actually making the anechoic chamber. This also include the infill materials and the springs. We were left over with $1,770. The reason that we had so much left over was because we were able to acquire quite a few things at no cost. Uh, we were able to check out from the university a decibel meter, which is what we used as one of our uh, measures to record the decibels. We were able to find a quiet location on campus at no cost, and we were able to have our prototype manufacturing done by Gordon. The production budget, which is what it would cost Gordon to produce this um, in-house, we had to keep it under $40 per linear foot. With our estimations, we came up to $32.87 per linear foot. Uh, this included the infill materials and the labor. So we were able to meet the requirement for less than $40. A cost that wasn't taken into consideration within our budget, but it was just good to know, was the $6,500, which would be what it would cost to make all of the extrusion dies. Uh, that will be done once they uh, have concluded the design process. The recommendations that we have for Gordon is that they get our design uh, lab verified because all of the testing that we have done thus far has been strictly uh, decibel uh, changes between before and after. For us to get an actual STC test, it has to be done by a third party. Um, and also we made sure that we did not infringe upon the mullet over patent, which is a competitor. They don't have, the mullet over patent does not have the inside spring. So as long as we continue with that design, we should be okay, and we were. Uh, the broader impacts for this uh, project was uh, confidentiality, because these things can, these mullion mates can be installed within hospitals or lawyer's offices. So that's where you need uh, confidentiality between doctor and patient or lawyer and the person they're advising. Also natural disaster mitigation, because of the spring within the mullion mate, it is able to um, expand and contract within the wall. So that force is no longer being taken up by the drywall itself. It's being able to uh, you be used within the spring. So whenever it's like we were speaking of earlier, whenever there's wind or heat or expansion or contraction of any sort, the, um, the damage is not being taken into the structure. 
Um, and finally, it, even though it seems like a small architectural fixture, it actually brings in quite a big uh, part of Gordon's capital projects because there's nothing like this in the market. Uh, the only other thing that is in the market doesn't expand and contract like their uh, project does. Are there any questions? I've got a question. Um, so kind of assuming from the other Mullion project, uh, there's a good bit of spacing between the springs um, in, in the smaller extrusion portion. Uh, I, I don't know, I'd say uh, four, uh, a, a foot or two of spacing between the springs. Did you evaluate adding uh, insulation in that portion of the extrusion as well? Or are you only adding it to the, the larger portion? We did data testing with uh, insulation surrounding the springs when we did our double million insulation testing. So that was accounted for. Yeah, as we can see in this final picture, the insulation is also uh, put into the smaller section where the spring is. Um, so whenever they would be installing or whenever they are putting it together, the sections that have spring uh, on either side of it has rock wool insulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> With your design change, um, getting rid of the tombstone and letting the spring get captured with the tab of his own tombstone, um, I guess I didn't see any dimensions on how wide this is, but does that increase the time it takes to assemble one of these? Because you it now does. have to put these springs in place, and how long is that? Due to us being a part and the uh, testing, uh, apparatus being in Ruston, we weren't actually able to test that. We That was one of our de designated uh, testing things we wanted to do, but we weren't able to. But we feel that it probably would increase the time it takes to install the, um, the springs in place, but we talked it up to, it's it's one of the costs of having a higher STC product. It, it might be a little bit more difficult to uh, put together and assemble, which was not a, uh, we weren't required to make it easier to assemble by court. Yeah, our main uh, goal for this project was to reach the 60 SDC. And uh, I didn't ask this of the other group, but uh, this is the first time I've heard of a million mate. Um, mm -hmm. Is this sent to the contractor in pieces and they have to assemble it on site and cut it to the length they want, or do they buy 10 foot, eight foot, depending on the height of the walls and everything? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a great question. And yeah, they definitely give dimensions of what they want. And in some cases, they actually give like, if there is a horizontal mullion, they will let the Gordon know. And Gordon will cut notches for them so that the, the mullion mate will fit over the horizontal mullions. And so it's as simple for the contractors to walk up, cut the tape, move the movie piece, and you know, simple as that. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Um, so I saw in your STC testing that you sent to the third party, um, the design that um, the company sent had an STC mm -hmm. of 68, but you said it was different than the design that y'all had. How was it different? And how can you make the comparison of, you know, make it similar? Like, yeah, we believe that it will be 68 right. STC as well. Explain that. So, thanks for the question. And the, the 68 STC was actually referring to the solid high STC wall. So that was like the baseline testing. So like the high, so it was like a, it's a comp, it's a composite STC. So it's not actually that our product itself scored 60. It's the, the wind paired with the 68 STC wall and the mullion encapsulated, we got 59 to 60 with rock wool in that. Okay. And the changes done uh, with their design versus our design, they did not incorporate the um, perforated sheet and the composite uh, infill materials have not been implemented as well. Also, I think you said that we sent our data off, which is not actually how that worked. They did their own data testing. So it's like okay. lab verified. So it's like we can use it in official reports for like customers and things. Okay. So it, it, it actually cost a lot of money for Gordon to send it off and yeah. make it official. So the changes, the differences between what they tested and, and the design y'all have were um, the perforated sheet, which you said did improve STC as well as the composite filling. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And we, we can say that because our um, 
decibels, our, our transmission loss is higher. And so just a decibel to decibel comparison, that means the SDC score will be higher. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? There's a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. How did you go about testing the force resilience? Uh, I don't know who asked that. The force resilience was actually calculated by doing a moment force calculation. So with the combination of the adhesive gasket and the spring, we found a um, bending, a bending stress along the entire 10 foot length, which is what we based it on. And we found that at the maximum bending arm, along the mullion mate, it was able to support about 250 pounds. We just said 200 to be conservative. And that was all hand calcs. We didn't run any actual FDA simulations or anything, but that's all in our report. And then the other question is, is there a particular gap test that the mullion mate will function for? So the base, basically, um, the inner piece of extrusion can be made to be longer or shorter depending on how wide the gap needs to be. Mm. So that, that's the variability. The, the female extrusion, uh, the piece that gets stuck on the wall does not change size at all. It, it's a constant size, but the male extrusion is the one that would change depending on the gap size. Right. So this makes it easier for Gordon because they would only have to buy one set of uh, springs. So right. the actual expansion mechanism stays the same. The part that has all the infill material, the cork and the composite infill material, is the sizes that would actually have to be either extended or shortened depending on the gap. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> how, how different is this new Muyun mate than I guess our current design? You didn't start from scratch, right? You had an initial design with a tombstone and it had right. some sort of infill. And I guess all you really changed was the, to the there's no tombstone now or the tombstone's built in and that perforated wall and how you we actually redesigned both of the extrusion profiles. So before it was just two U-shapes and now there's not only tabs for the difference, but there's also the constant volume chamber. So before their um, infill material is always getting squished and now there's a constant volume chamber that never gets squished. Right, so before it was simply just two U-shaped extrusions that came together with a spring in the middle held by uh, tombstones that were sl slid on the tracks. So now they don't have to worry, like Ryan was saying, about the compression of the material within uh, the, the actual molding mate. So once they fill their mill comp compartment, it stays at that density, which is really important for sound transmission. Because as we were saying, if the material gets really compressed, uh, more decibels can get through and it'll actually make a huge difference between the rooms. Additionally, our design also makes it easier to cut notches to, to, to allow the mullion to slide over um, horizontal mullion if they need to be. All right. Well, that actually does it for our time today. Um, so, again, great job. Um, mullion mate team, I guess y'all are mullion mate team one. Um, <laughs> We're just high STC mullion mate. Thank you. Like Thank that. you. Um, yeah, and then for all the students still here, great job by all, um, and then advisory board members, big thank you, y'all, um, really appreciate y'all's time, um, to the university in general, but especially to, to our students and giving them this feedback, um, I know that it was just good, good feedback hearing from somebody other than their, their professors who, you know, they've, by, after four years, they've learned to tune us out, so, um, so, the oh, session awards or the award session. I don't know why it's session awards. Anyway, um, starts at 515. So I will put here in the chat, everybody, the link to join that. Um, yeah, so there that is. Um, again, you can just you, or you either click on that or you can just type in that number um, and that'll take you over there. Um, so that'll start shortly. So advisory council, if y'all could 
get y'all scores in for that. Um, again, thank y'all so much for being here. Um, those of y'all who tuned in to support your um, to support your seniors, um, thank y'all for being here as well. Um, I'll hang out here for a little bit, but then I'll end the meeting probably at about 5.05, which will kick you out um, as well. And then we'll head over to the award sessions. Hey, Ethan, thank you for your help, man. I no appreciate problem. You. I appreciate you doing all that, man. Hey, is that yeah. Brantley? Yeah. I appreciate oh, it. Oh. I don't have the Tim's. You doing good? I'm trying to stay warm, man. It's snowing outside. It's not here. It's <laughs> not here. Hey, it is 73 degrees and sunny. I wish, <laughs> man. I wish. Louisiana, it's beautiful. Come on back. We've already we hit a couple of 80 days last week. We're going to get some next week. I might have to come out for a visit. You have to let that, uh, let that, uh, that border open for me. That's right, man. That's right. Well, come on back. We'd love to have you. See y'all. All right, man.